2023 work session, school board meeting, and closed session to order. Ms. Goodell, could you please take the roll? Yes, uh, Dr. Anderson? Here. Dr. Dimmick? Here. Ms. Downs? Here. Dr. Gould? Here. Dr. Ortiz? Here. Ms. Silverman? Here. And Ms. Tice? Here. Thank you. Thank you. If you could join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We are at 2.04. If I could have a motion to adopt the agenda. Chair, I move that we adopt the agenda as presented. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Could I have a second? Thank you, Dr. Anderson. All those in favor say yes. Yes. All those opposed say no. Thank you. Motion carries. And I'll just, um, for those of you who are looking at the agenda, um, any of the public, you'll see that we had a meet and greet just before this meeting. And just wanted to welcome um, Dr. David Jack, who's our interim head of secondary school. So we enjoyed having some time with you. And we're really grateful uh, that you're joining Falls Church City Public School. So. I know that you and Dr. Nonan have known each other for a while, and he, you come highly recommended. So we're very thankful for your, for your help and uh, all your good experience that you're going to be bringing to Falls Church City Public Schools. I want to know that he's school board meeting 15 years. He, he was bragging about not having to prepare for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Dr. Noonan, he can't say the same. <laughs> but thank you. It's okay. Nice, nice to have you here. Thank you. And also, those for those who of the public who might have seen um, an earlier version of the agenda, we did have a collective bargaining on a previous version of the agenda, and we've decided um, we're going to hold off on that and um, hopefully talk about that at our next meeting. Um, there's a lot of moving pieces. It's a complicated topic, so we want to make sure we we talk about that when everyone's prepared for that. So we'll do that at a future meeting. Okay, so we are at 3.01, uh, Legislative Advocacy and Priorities, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Noonan. Okay, thank you, Chair Downs, and good evening, everybody. Thank you all for being here. Um, tonight, um, this is an opportunity that you may remember from last year, um, an opportunity to talk a little bit about um, our, our legislative priorities or your legislative priorities as a school board. Um, we've had great representation from um, school board member Silverman, um, who represented all of us really well last year, uh, along with Lilla Wise. And this year, um, we have someone new working with us, and we're really excited to welcome Patrick Finneran. Um, so Patrick, I'm going to ask you to come on up to the table if you'd like. Um, but I, I do want to sort of set the table a little bit, and as I turn it over to uh, Ms. Silverman, just to say that this is the first sort of cut at the first bite at the apple, if you will. Um, we have a, a little bit of time to work through the legislative agenda. We have a couple of things that are coming up that I think will certainly influence the conversation. Um, we have the legislative breakfast that's coming up um, that many of us go to, uh, where we get together with Alexandria, Arlington, um, and others. And then also, uh, you all will be attending the VSBA conference in November, and there'll be a legislative agenda that's prepared for VSBA as well um, that you may want to pick up some things on, um, pick up a few things to add to your agenda. Um, but this really is not the state's agenda. This is, this tonight is really a discussion about what your agenda as the Board of City of Falls Church is. So with that, uh, Ms. Silverman, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Noonan, and, and uh, Mr. Finneran, thank you for joining us tonight and for uh, working on this legislative package. Um, I, 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 in, in some ways, I feel like it's a little bit premature to be talking about our legislative um, package, you know, when we have an election in just a few weeks. Um, you know, we ha currently have the divided government and, you know, the, both the House of Delegates and the um, Senate are both going to be on the ballot this year, and so we will. A lot of this is going to be. I, I and Mr. Finneran can definitely speak more eloquently about this, but you know, um, how, you know, uh, the government, the governor is going to be setting a budget this year, and I think a lot of this just depends on what happens in just a few weeks. Um, and you know, both of our um, representatives will be on the ballot, so hope everybody votes. And um, you, you know, in terms of what the VSBA. Uh, priorities are again I think they're pretty much in a wait and see mode um, I know there's a lot of talk about different areas of funding but again there's talk of but we just don't know what it's going to look like so um, with that Mr. Finner and I will turn it over to you okay, well, thank you very much uh, 
Okay, well, well thank you very much uh, for, for that introduction and for your help, too. And, and uh, as we begin to start to take a look at some of the issues, and I've had a chance to meet with uh, Dr. Noonan and uh, school board member Sil Silverman, um, just to get an idea of what Falls Church is all about. Um, and I tell you what, I, I think the, um, when looking at this, um, the draft, and again, as Dr. Noonan said, this is a draft legislative program, something just to get us talking, to get your, uh, us thinking. Um, but I want to make sure that I really get a sense of what you all want for the legislative packet. So this is very open to change. Um, and as I go through it, you can either ask questions now or just, you know, email me later or however we want to do that through Dr. Noonan or, or through, through, through Ms. Silverman. Um, but I think the, um, this, this draws heavily on from the, the last the 2023 legislative program. It has a lot of uh, positions in it. But I put front and center on here some of the, uh, some of the funding issues, I think. We're going to have kind of a, a perfect storm of funding issues this year. The governor's budget, it's his two-year budget, is coming out. For, so when that's passed, you'll live with that for the next two years. Uh, it gives the governor, obviously, an opportunity to make a lot of changes. But, it, but as someone once has, used to tell me, uh, one, of our legis one of my legislators, the governor proposes, the General Assembly disposes. And so <laughs> it's up to them to make the final decisions on what's going to happen with the budget. Uh, of course, it does have to go back to the governor for, for um, a signature, but it's really the work that's done during the General Assembly will be huge on, on this. Secondly, it's a rebenchmarking year. So every two years, uh, the state takes a look at all the metrics involving how we fund public education. This is that year. So a new governor's new budget, rebenchmarking. And then third, um, the JLARC, the Joint Legislative Audit and Review Commission, I came out with a really a blockbuster report uh, this past June about public education and how it's funded and really how it's been underfunded uh, systematically for decades. Um, there are about 20 different proposals, both short and long term, in that JLARC report. And I've incorporated some of those into this legislative program. Those can change if you see something. And I'll go ahead and send all of the, uh, I'll send an email with all of the legislative proposals that JLARC made uh, so you can take a look at those more easily. But I put some of them in there that look at really some core fundamental ways uh, public education is, is funded. And I've also looked at the, um, the funding uh, uh, formulas and how it would change. And it looks like each one, uh, Falls Church, uh, City Public Schools, does come out better. And I, did, I saw some school divisions that maybe fell back a little bit on a few things, but Falls Church looks uh, very favorable, um, as do almost every, as does e almost every other school division. So starting with that, um, the the uh, funding formula report basically said that, uh, on a, looking at all states in the country, where I think it was 14% um, average average states receive 14% four, more funding than in Virginia. Um, and according to JLARC, that equates to $1,900 per student. So you say $2,000 you know, per student times how many you have. And across the state, of course, that's an, an enormous number. Uh, so there's going to be a, a lot of, hopefully, a lot of discussion on this JLARC report and how it impacts us. Um, I think the JLARC report showed that uh, the state does not fund, on average, about 25 to 30 percent of the of the um, uh, staff staffing that schools have in Virginia, and that's mentioned in this report. Uh, as it's one of the reasons that it needs to take a look, a hard look at what's going on. Um, so I'm hoping that that will be driving a lot of the discussion of our legislators this year. And no matter what happens, you know, if, it, if Senate, you know, if it stays the same, if, if Senate changes, House changes. I think it's still going to be something that they can't get away from because it's such a big report. Um, so, you know, in looking at this, the um, the but I, I put in a few things like uh, we should consider ask ask the general assembly members to consider um, 
including all school division central office positions in the SOQ formula. Right now that's not done. I think it's probably 75%. Uh, apply the cost of competing adjust adjustment, which is obviously very relevant here, uh, to facility and transportation staff salaries in the SOQ formula. I know that you also have a, a, a position, and I kept it in here, uh, just to have all, all staff included in that, in that cost of competing formula. But I think it's good that the JLARC report mentions this and really adds some emphasis to that. Uh, remove the, the cap on adjustments um, for assumptions in, in uh, the benchmarking process. Right now, oh, when we re-benchmark, we go back at least two years, um, and those numbers are lower, and of course, they're not, they're not adequate anyway. So if we take a look at that, that, that drives a lot of money. Um, and a cost, account for the cost of facilities staff salaries in, in, uh, in the cost of adjust, in the, in the uh, compensation supplement calculations. Uh, also looking at eliminating the support cap, which I know has been in your, in your board packet. Um, reinstating non-personnel cost categories, and that might not be a big deal for, it's mainly travel, rentals, things like that, that some school divisions have, but they don't get really reimbursed for. Um, and most, in, in essence, these would undo what we call the Great Recession changes back in, I think it was 2009, 2010, when lots of money was just wiped away from public education, and we'd never gotten back there. So this report gets to that. Um, Rebenchmarking, again, uh, just want to make sure that they get a f the full accounting for all the money that's owed to the school divisions in this, what's really a technical process. It's not, it's not, um, uh, it's not really even political, but they, we want to make sure that they do all the technical work and, and fund what, what every school, do, school division should get. Um, then there's support caps, uh, st support staff cap, we've talked about that. Uh, the SOQ funding, you know, the state board has uh, for a number of years now recommended hundreds of millions of dollars in, in additions to SOQ funding. And um, they've done a little bit on that. They, I think the General Assembly in the last couple of years added some assistant principals uh, to the SOQ funding. But there's a lot more that needs to be done, and hopefully that will, um, that will work out. Mental health support. Last year there was a great package of mental health um, legislation that in the, in the compromise just got left out. So I think your, 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 uh, the position that you had from last year is still very valid and, and should be very strong. English language learner staffing. Um, again, there's a lot. We, we know how many people are coming into this area that need the English language um, support and just trying to boost up the teacher ratios for that is, is, is very important to all of us. Um, the voter referendum for school construction and modernization, I know that was in there last year. I'm not sure if it was um, a priority position, but I left that in there because I think it's something that um, nine school boards right now have the ability to go and ask their voters if, if we want to add us up to 1% sales tax. Um, and why only nine school divisions have it is kind of, a, 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 a kind of baffling to a lot of people. So this would just say all school divisions should have that opportunity. It's not a mandate. And again, the locality would have to approve it. Uh, cost of competing, I don't need to talk to you about that. You all know all about the cost of competing. It's very expensive up here, and you need those additional dollars. Um, and things like uh, tuition tax credits, tax deductions, vouchers that would divert money away from public education is still remains you know, in your packet as, as opposing any of that. Um, safe gun storage. Um, I worked with another school division that had a, a, um, a student actually shoot a, um, a teacher. And um, you know, we, that, this is something that if we had st some stronger laws for safe gun storage, maybe that would have helped. But it's something that we should be looking at. I know that uh, Delegate Simon last year introduced that. Um, it was supported by lots of people, but couldn't get through the House. Uh, so we'll, I think taking another run at that, if you all still want to do that, is something we'll look at. Uh, and then again, uh, looking at something that would uh, allow, um, I guess, easier access to, 
electronic meetings. So there's a few hoops you have to jump through right now, and that could be cleared up. Uh, not a major issue, but I think it's something that, that's worth looking at. Um, assessments, um, and then in-state tuition for DACA students. Those were both in your packet last year. So that's really, um, in a nutshell, just taking a look at, the, at some of the things that you had last year in your packet that, that uh, should remain, and then some of the other really more funding types of issues, the budgetary issues that I think should be looked at. Uh, again, this is a, a start. I want to do want to congratulate you uh, last year for getting um, Delegate Simon's bill on uh, pre pre-K regulations uh, through. Uh, that was nice. A lot of times it takes three, four years to get a bill through. So in your first shot out at that, that was very, very uh, uh, rewarding, I think, to get that done. So, um, and I'll just be, I'll just take any questions or comments, suggestions. Again, this is just a start and would like to see you know, how you'd like to proceed. And uh, so I think that would be best facility facilitated by me not saying much more. Ms. Silverman, did you want to kick us off? Chair, I feel like I'm stepping out of my role here. <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Finneran, for that presentation. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments? <laughs> Mr. Ortiz. Yes. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Finneman. I have uh, just two questions, and these are probably just for me being naive more so than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, one is um, um, our, he's not late, but he's a um, former school board member, Phil um, Redinger, was uh, ensured that the, the, the local, the LCI, and addressing how the, the LCI redistributes funds um, away from districts like Falls Church was addressed in our legislative priorities. To what degree are the, is, the, is mm. that covered in the um, in the JLARC um, recommendations that you have I see some flavor of it here in SOQ and in like right. competition but I, I don't see that explicitly stated yeah I think I think that if I remember correctly they there are some short-term recommendations and that's mainly what's in here then there are some longer term looking at some really meaty funding issues I believe that is covered uh, a bit I think the uh, JLARC said that for the most part, and people could disagree with this, the LCI uh, did a fairly good job of getting money to the school divisions that need it more. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think it came out strongly in favor of, of changing it, but I think it was addressed in, in some ways. Okay. I could take a look at that more closely if you okay. like. Okay, uh, thank you. And then just one more question regarding the JLARC report. It, it has gotten a lot of traction. To what degree do you think that um, us framing the legislative um, agenda around the JLARC report um, um, uh, puts us in a better position to having those items be addressed by the legislature? Well, I'm, ho I'm hoping, that's a great question, because I'm, I'm hoping that school boards around the, the state take a look at this JLARC report and help, uh, you know, kind of put this front and center instead of one or two of their, their, their personal, you know, issues that they have. Uh, I know that the VSBA and the VA, VS School Board Association and VAS did sign a, um, a letter, uh, a joint press release when it came out. So they're, they're really looking into this. And I think uh, we'll know more, as, as Dr. Noonan said, uh, VAS is having its, uh, not really a legislative program, but a lot of legislative work will be going on this next Monday, Tuesday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Uh, so hopefully we'll hear more about what VAS is doing on that front and then VSBA later in, in uh, November uh, should come out with a lot of recommendations. I do think that they will come out with some heavy recommendations on the JLARC report. This is a uh, really a, 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 just a monumental report. A lot of research went into this. Um, and it's, so it's, it's, it's validating, I think, um, feelings and beliefs that school board members and school divisions have had for years and now it's quantifying it and saying, yes, this is, this is how it is, this is how other states do it, and this is how, you know, some of the recommendations we're, we're making for it. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, um, I'm hoping that a lot of school divisions do this, uh, you know, do, do put it front and center, because it's, it's a very important issue. Um, as you know, funding drives so much of what we do. It's not, the, it's not everything, but it's, it's, it's a lot, especially when you come to teacher pay, uh, you know, I think they're right now there's over a thousand 
unfilled teaching positions in Virginia. Um, and, you know, uh, school divisions are begging for teachers to come in. And pay is not all, it, all the issue, but it, it's, it could be, you know, part of the issue if we could pay more. Uh, so does that help at all? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. This just feels awkward. Uh, Dr. Gould, please. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Silverman. Uh, the, uh, I appreciate the overview and the, and the organization of this. In terms of um, the, uh, the electronic meetings, clearly the uh, advisory committees are important for us to connect with the community and engagement and obviously post-COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we got used to the ability to have more engagement virtually. You mentioned, I think you mentioned there are additional factors for this that might be complicating this. Can you elaborate on what is the, in your mind, what are the issues holding this up from being successfully passed? Well, the electronic issues, yeah, I, I took a look at in, a little bit into this, and there's a lot of leeway in having electronic, you know, meetings for school boards, but then when you do get into some of the um, things that are not necessarily just school board, but they're community meetings, uh, I think there's some hesitancy on the part of, um, of lawmakers to just say you can do a, you know, to take all the all the constraints off. Uh, there also might be a sense that it's not really that urgent, too. So I think this being in here will, um, you know, at least for our legislators here, um, bring it to the forefront. And if we can get some legislation on it uh, to really define it, and I'd like to like to learn a little bit more about what the issues were or are here. Um, in, in Falls Church with electronic meetings so we can explain that better to our legislators. It only takes one legislator to put in a bill. So uh, if that gets out, uh, I didn't, don't think I saw one last year on it. Um, so if that gets out, at least get some discussion started. And again, I've, I've seen some very practical, no-nonsense issues go two, three, four years before it gets enough traction to, to get on everybody's radar and get passed. So um, I, I think I think it may be part partly just a knowledge, an awareness issue. And yeah, and again, I'd like to learn more about this issue mm -hmm. from Falls Church perspective. Chair Downs, thanks. Yeah, I, I think it's basically. Uh, having the electronic participation just enables more people to be involved um mm -hmm. you know this uh this area has a lot of people with very demanding jobs and and so just the availability of being able to participate via zoom from the workplace or what have you i think just opens it up to a lot more people being involved i think is, is basically it but um thank you so much for this presentation it's i was speaking with you before this meeting it's just um really informative presentation. Uh, I think, and, and Dr. Noonan, you and I spoke about the importance of getting this JLARC uh, study out to our, our community, because I think people would be shocked, you know, just a couple sound bites here. Uh, many states are, are giving $1,900 more, funding $1,900 more per student than we are, than Virginia is. Um, Virginia schools are um, six, six to 30 percent below funding below where we need to be. Um, so it just, you know, I think it is something that we take for granted mm -hmm. that we're that we're doing well, and we're really actually not doing well in terms mm -hmm. of funding education. And so one of the things that Dr. Noon and I have been participating in is a local group of um, in the Northern Virginia area of school board chairs and superintendents and school board members. And we talked about this a lot at our last meeting. And really, the um, there was a strong desire from the Northern Virginia section to really tried to lead the effort on this mm -hmm. on behalf of the entire state mm -hmm. um, to really, um, because obviously we, uh, Dr. Ortiz talked about the local composite index. We do have, we are more fluent up in this area and really what the talk was is like, let's lead the state and let's really get this information out there. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think there is, a, that the local systems are really trying to coordinate to, to uh, address these, these gaps that JLARC has come out with. Um, I think, you know, with the local composite index, I completely remember uh, Mr. Reidinger talking about that. 
um, <laughs> Dr. Noon smirking, and I, I also remember, <laughs> no, I, in a good way, in a good way. It's <laughs> fun times, like memories, and so, but, but your predecessor uh, talked to us about that she didn't think there was much appetite to talk about LCI. So I still think we yeah. should explore it because it is, you know, sometimes when we have funding from the state, it's always, there's that stipulation that it's, so, you know, we get 20 cents to the mm -hmm. dollar. And mm -hmm. so it is, um, you know, we have such a 85%, or I guess 82% of our budgets locally funded. So, you know, we are, it is just, a, it is a heavy burden on our local government. So I think it's worth exploring, but, um, you know, knowing that there's other parts of the state that are in much more financial need than, than we are. So it's, it's definitely a hard balance. Um, Dr. Noon, I, w I thought if you wouldn't mind for a second to explain the, um, the support cap piece. Oh, sure, be happy to. Um, so the support cap um, is, is one of those um, recession um, era cuts that happened. And for, for some time, um, fortunately, or, uh, we were getting funding at a different level for positions that were identified in the SOQ, the standards of quality that were specifically designated as support. So support could be things like, um, and Mr. Finneran, you can help correct me if, I'm, if I get off a little bit, because sometimes um, there is a little bit of confusion about what is support and what isn't support. But things like school counselors, assistant principals, um, other people that are not directly tied to a classroom. Um, and so what those, uh, SOQ positions, um, what happened to those SOQ positions is their, their funding was cut um, by quite a bit um, to the extent where, to the extent that school divisions across the Commonwealth lost a lot of money in those support positions. And so what we have been um, asking for is to get back to those positions being refunded um, to the levels that they were prior to the recession. And it is worth quite a bit of money to the Falls Church City Public Schools if we were to get that, um, get that done. Um, because as uh, Mr. Finneran mentioned, we already over, not overfund, we already fund significant numbers of positions beyond what the standards of quality ask for or require of any school division. Um, and so every dollar for us that we get into our budget actually really matters. Um, so I'm hopeful that we can continue to sort of beat the drum. Um, you know, there is, uh, to a great extent, um, and it's not a secret, there, there's a surplus in Richmond. Um, and now is the time. Um, it's not, these are not uh, times to be, um, you know, tentative with asking for money. I think now is the time, frankly, to be really aggressive because it's not a, um, it's not a time where, where there's austerity measures in place. So um, I'd love for us to, to continue to, to fight for some of that, some of that money back into our coffers. Great. Thank you, Doctor. And, and I know just recently there was um, a, a, some, a tutoring program put in place and um, with money going towards tutors. But, you know, again, looking at the J and that's great, but looking at the JLARC study, we really have, there's a deficit in terms of spending per pupil um, that really needs to be addressed. So, th so that's, that's, Terrific, but there's a bigger funding issue at play here. So can I can I also mm -hmm. pick up on that because sure, I do please. think it's important for and I think the board knows it, but for the community to know it too. Um, and that is because of the local composite index that we have of a point eight. Um, and I'll use two examples. One is um, the SOQ funding. The SOQ funding flows through the LCI, the local composite index. So even if we were to get the full funding for a position we are still required to pay for 80% of that position because we're a 0.8 district. And that means about 20% of that position is paid for by the state. So I don't want anyone in the, in the viewing audience to think that when we get a position that's funded through the SOQ that we're getting 100% of that position. 80% of it is still being paid for by the locality. Um, the same goes for um, uh, another comment that came up in the last process with the budget. Um, the la when they finally signed a budget in Richmond, everybody came out of Richmond really excited uh, because the governor put a 2% raise mm -hmm. into the budget for staff, right? Um, that also flows through the funding formula. So, so for us, and let's just use round numbers, if we were to give a raise of a 2% amount to all of our staff and faculty, that would cost us somewhere in the neighborhood of a half a million dollars. I'll just use a round number here. We get 
20% of that money from the state, and then we, uh, the locality, are on the hook for the remainder of that. So in order for us to be able to do a 2% adjustment to pay, we have to pony up locally to, ma to not just match, but exceed what the state gives us by 80%. So um, it, is a, it is an issue for us, um, but, but as was sort of mentioned, it is a tricky balance because you know, when we think about um, you know, school divisions in Virginia that have far less than we have, um, you know, they, they need the money that's coming through the state. So um, we do have a greater ability to pay, but, but it is challenging all the way across. But I want to make sure everybody understands in the viewing audience, because I think the school board gets it, that we only get 20% of the dollars for the SOQ funded positions that are fully funded. Thank you, Doctor. And it is it is challenging. We we are um, a more fluent area, but we're also a little city, to use the phrase. So so it is it is um, you know it is can be tough in that sense too. Yes, Ms. Silverman. And I just wanted to make one more comment about the LCI. Um, you know, if it's in the JLARC report, get, you know um, that then it's, it it might be taken a look at and it might be considered. I I would still be hesitant to address the LCI specifically in our legislative um, package just because you know not that I don't want more money from the state I obviously would love to get you know a hundred percent of the funds from the state and not have to pay any taxes wouldn't that be great but you know I, first of all I do worry that if we open up that door um, would they change the law and allow it for us to be at 90 percent um, you, you know we, we don't know what could happen in that situation and and secondly I do feel just for equity purposes and reasons as, as Dr. Noonan just stated that there's many other districts um, you know throughout the state that um, that probably do need the more funds than than we do in Falls Church City even though you know we, we all feel the tax burden ourselves and the um, little city burden as well that um, that funding is we funding funding uh, challenges are more prevalent in a smaller community but um i just would be wary about putting lci directly into the proposal could i add to that at all Please. that'd be fine yeah i appreciate it. and i appreciate your question uh, dr ortiz uh, I, I did find it it's a policy option number three in the, in the jlark report it basically says it's it's not a recommendation it's just a like look at this it says it could amend the code of virginia and include language in the Appropriation Act directing the replacement of the local composite index with a revenue capacity index, which, um, you know, again, could could harm schools, school divisions, or localities that have higher revenue uh, than is currently accounted for in the LCI. So, it is a, a, a two-edged sword on that. There, there will be winners and losers, um, and, but it, it, I think it's a policy option. Uh, with no recommendation because it's it's a big issue and it's 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 one of these long-term things they're not recommending that it state look at this year or even next year thank you yeah and that's well said Ms. Silverman I think you know we're all going to be going down to VSBA in, in a couple weeks and I think that's when we talk to our colleagues in the different parts of the state and we realize that they are struggling with things that we we don't have to struggle with so i think it's really i think it becomes even more clear when we meet with our colleagues uh down in the more in the southern part of the state and rural parts of the state so Ms. silverman do you want to close this out any other any other questions or comments Okay, seeing none, uh, Dr. Finneran, Mr. Finneran, sorry, Dr. Pat, um, Pat thank <laughs> you, Pat. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, you've got big shoes to fill with Lilla. Um, mm -hmm. She was fantastic Absolutely. to work with, but um, I, I think I can speak on behalf of the board that um, I have confidence that we'll, we'll, we'll work well with you. Um, this has been tremendously helpful as a draft to get us started, and we'll be in touch. Great. Thank you. To, thank you um, very much for that, and thank you to the, the board. and. Um, uh, the executive team here uh, really appreciate any any ideas and thoughts that you have I guess you could direct them through the superintendent or the Silverman and uh, I'll be happy to take a look at look at any of that so, and look forward to coming back great thank you so much and we'll we'll get that JLARC study out to the community and tell them to start lobbying Richmond for uh, more funding for education for our state yeah. so all right thank you thank you very much all Mr. Right. Fairman and you all have a great night thank you okay. you too 
Okay, we are uh, going to move on to our next uh, agenda item, 3.02 school start times and early release Wednesdays. And Dr. Noon, did you want to kick us off? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, first, first and foremost, I want to thank the board members. Um, uh, and, I, and if the community doesn't know this, I want to make sure they do. And that is that I think you've held up to 10 at this point. Um, city, eight, eight out of 10. Yeah will be 10 uh, forums uh, regarding the early release Wednesday and start times to gather feedback from um, staff, from uh, parents. Uh, you've got a student forum coming up. Uh, and, and I just really appreciate the effort that you all have put into um, gathering as much information and data as possible regarding um, sort of the thoughts of the community uh, around this. I know that there are um, probably um, competing interests across uh, all different stakeholders and even within stakeholders. Um, and I think that it's good for you all to hear that. Um, we have tried to uh, present to you an, uh, an option or two or three or four um, that we, we believe would work, um, and we uh, are continuing to uh, field questions that come up, and we'll continue to, to field those as they come up. But I think tonight, um, my hope is that you all will have a chance to sort of share what you've heard um, at your, your forums that you've held. So mm -hmm. I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Noon. Uh, yes, we have he held uh, eight eight town halls and we started with um, we met with uh, parents at uh, Oak Street Elementary as well as um, Mount Daniel and then the secondary campus and we met with staff at Jesse Thackeray at Mount Daniel twice at Oak Street and at the secondary campus and we as Dr. Noon said we were still meeting with students um, Mr. Lewin's helping us with that, and, and Vice Chair Gould, and then also our ESOL community with Dr. Ortiz has been helping coordinate that. Um, that meeting is this Sunday. So by the end of it, we'll have met, um, had 10 different meetings between uh, parents and students and staff. And uh, to just to refresh everyone's memory, why, why we sort of took this on, uh, we, two different subjects, start times and early release. Um, Start Times really came out of our Health and Wellness Committee had advocated uh, to start uh, our secondary campus at a later, later time. And that was really looking at the research out there, particularly from the American Academy of Pediatrics, that 830 was sort of the gold standard to start secondary schools. And so we decided to explore that a little further. And in terms of early release, uh, that's really from, you know, over the – over the years, we've, we've been getting emails, um, you know, periodically from parents who had talked to us about that this was, um, could we examine early release Wednesdays? We're the only school system that still has them in this area. They can be a burden on parents who have two working parents or a single working parent. And, um, you know, could we really look at that and see if they're still necessary? On the flip side, uh, you know, we also understand that early release Wednesdays are a big benefit to our staff. Um, because they're used for pro professional development. They're also used for meetings. And um, so those, th there's, you know, definitely, uh, as there always is, two, two different perspectives from er on early release Wednesdays. And so we really wanted to dig in and uh, have some time to talk with the community, again, the staff, parents, and students about both of these topics. So as I think Ms. Tice had, had termed this, you know, we were on a listening tour. And so we thought, um, again, not having met with the students yet or the ESOL community, we have met with the bulk of the community and um, wanted to sort of just talk about our, our uh, discussions and, you know, just, you know, just really kind of put out there what, what, you know, in terms of the board, what really stuck with you. So we're going to start with the start times. and. Why don't we start with just feedback from the staff? And, and again, for, for the listening public, you know, start times mostly involves the secondary campus and er, early release mostly involves um, the elementary campus. Um, the, as Dr. Newton said, there were a couple different proposals put out there for early release, um, you know, and, and really we can look at those or we can, um, and no, no decisions being made tonight. Uh, but, you know, there, there's really um, all kinds of options out there. I think the board has, I don't think there's the will of the board is to get rid of them completely by any means. So it could be that um, after this discussion in terms of early release, we keep things as it is, we could reduce, we could change. So there's um, a lot to, to discuss tonight. But we'll go, go back and start with start times. And if anyone wants to kick us off about um, the feedback we met with the secondary 
uh, staff and any any thoughts from that conversation yes Ms. Tice oh. uh, sure so for the start time you said the secondary campus mm -hmm. for starting um, I thought that it was interesting that once we found a way to take some of the pressure off the afternoon ending later that seemed to really relieve a lot of concern I think uh, not completely but a, a lot of the concern what about changing the start time was it going too late into the afternoon and impacting sports and after school activities so um, I feel like once we were able to address that issue it really um, took the pressure off and that was that was really helpful to find that creative solution to Look at this. The, look at the way the day would um, would change in other ways. I do think that it would be really helpful f um, as we continue to try and educate the public and um, and communicate how what how the day would change um, if the day is going to be shorter. Where those minutes would come from, and not that that would be a school board decision. That's obviously operational and up to Dr. Noonan and the administration. But um, I think that that if we could communicate that sooner rather than later, um, at least the goals or the intentions of where that time would come from um, that that would be helpful because I do think that was where some of the concern was just the just the question question was right and I do think Dr. New we did I not think I know we heard that from both staff and parents where so so for those um, who are maybe catching up the original proposal back in the spring we had started this discussion in the spring and then put it on hold and, and resumed it this fall uh, the original proposal was to end at 3.30. And so um, because, I, I'll let you talk about the, the numbers and all that, but uh, there was an ability, we, we are in school enough that we could shave some time off that school day to end. So, so the proposal is now starting at 8.30 and ending at 3.10, which I think, as Ms. Ty said, is, is a little bit um, easier. Uh, people had concerns about athletics and that sort of thing. So um, what we heard, I think, from both the staff and the parents is where are those 15 minutes coming from? And that's something you have to answer right now, but. Yeah, no, I think it's a good question. Um, and it's, you know, having been a high school principal <laughs> and, and redone schedules uh, and, and calendars uh, on a fairly routine basis, um, the most typical way that you find time, like 15 minutes, is to shave a minute here or a minute there. Um, or two minutes here, or two minutes there. So if you look at, I, for example, each of our blocks, um, you know, we might shave of the four blocks two minutes off of each block each day. So that buys you eight minutes. And then if you, you know, shorten passing period by a minute, uh, you've got four passing periods, then you add four more minutes to that eight minutes, that gets you to, you know, 12, I guess. I'm sort of doing the math here in my head. 12, and maybe maybe you cut Mustang block by three minutes. So at that point, you've got the 15 minutes. It's negligible at best. Um, you know, it's not until you get into, you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes per block that it becomes problematic. So I certainly understand the concern that I think some of the teachers raised about um, opportunities to have uh, instructional time. Um, I think it's a, a legitimate concern that they share simply because of the pressures that they're feeling for kids to be highly successful in this community, uh, both in the International Baccalaureate Program and in, in uh, a standard curriculum course. Um, that being said, I, I don't think 15 minutes is insurmountable across the, um, across the day to find, to find time to the extent that it would be impactful um, in, in any real substantive way right off the bat. I don't, I don't want to overgeneralize because I think some people would probably take issue with that and say, you know, we don't have enough time as it is to teach. Um, so I want to be really cautious about that. But I do think, you know, if it's a two-minute cut in a, in a 75 minute block or a 70 minute block it's um it's probably doable mm -hmm. no, but that's I, how you find the time yeah no i think that that's just that's good because i think one of the things that a good conversation that this was on the parent side that some were talking about you know mustang block and they wouldn't want 15 minutes cut out of mustang block because some of their students really need that and and so i thought that was an interesting conversation so to know that there's not one part of the day that you're cutting 15 minutes out i think would be put some minds at ease. It, it would be very unlikely that we would take 15 minutes from one single chunk. You, right. you know, you just pull little bits and pieces throughout the day. Okay. And they just have to walk faster to class. That's right. <laughs> it's only seven stories. <laughs> yes, Ms. Silverman. Um, so what would, th having an 8.30 to 3.15 schedule at the secondary campus, what would that do to elementary times for both um, Oak Street and Mount Daniel? 
the way that we presented um, the last, it just depends on the model, but um, we did look at uh, if we did, let's see, let me pull it up real quick. I've got it right here in front of me. Um, if we moved the high school to uh, from 8:30 to 3:10, I think that's what we were saying. Not did you say 3:30? Yes, yeah, 3:10. Three, 3:10. Three three yeah, <coughs> I may have misspoke. Okay. Thank yeah. You. Okay. If we do 3:10, um, Mount Daniel and Oak Street would both start at nine, and Mount Daniel would end at 3:50, and Oak Street would end at four o'clock. Can you just explain why there's a difference in the 10 minutes? Um, one of the reasons is that um, we have traditionally given um, students at Oak Street a 20-minute lunch, and um, Ms. Doherty would like to give them a 30-minute lunch. And so it's an extension of the lunch period by 10 minutes. And it doesn't impact our transportation at all, because we have two separate sets of buses that transport Oak Street. and. Um, and Mount Daniel. And I will say, parents have sort of been happy about that, um, particularly if they have kids in two different schools. They, they can leave one school and still get to the other and pick up their, and be there on time as opposed to having them both end at exactly the same time. <laughs> yeah, just one thing that I've heard from parents, just um, from some of the elementary parents, is just how difficult it is to get to different activities, especially now if we're pushing elementary to four o'clock, um, getting on the soccer field, getting to you know doctor's appointments, whatever. Um, it's just an even later ending time, which you know, I'm not saying that's not a reason to make this change. I'm just saying that is a concern that I've heard from parents. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Silverman. Yes, Vice Chair Gould. Uh, at the, the we're still on the Meridian, the Heights, the secondary <coughs> campus teacher. Um, one of the uh, questions that was raised, Dr. Noonan, was about um, if we move start times, this is from one of the teachers, if we move start times to 8.30, the, uh, which is to try to give students more time to sleep, um, what would this create a block zero or put more activities in the morning time? Um, and would that kind of cancel out the start time concept of trying to give more time? I think that we also heard from that is a lot of the activities that are in the morning now are kind of not voluntary, but like more extracurricular. So it's 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 basically if the student chooses that, they're choosing that kind of style or that that uh, that kind of activity. But any thoughts on that initially from that? I, I think my initial instinct is that it wouldn't change substantively to add more to the morning. Um, I think there's always the possibility that some sports and, and, and the like are going to practice in the morning. Um, already they do that, even if even with our current um, schedule, and it's a, really around the space needs more than any more than time. Um, and you know, I, right now in terms of curricular courses, we are teaching the TOK in the uh, the zero hour, if you will, and I anticipate we'll continue with that. Um, but I, I don't anticipate that we would add a whole lot more into that time. But those, those would be conversations we would likely have with our high school principal. Thank you, Vice Shrigal. Yes, Ms. Tice. Oh, I was just going to say, to that point, um, I, would, I would love to make sure that anything that is, that is happening before 830 would be along something that felt, like to, to Dr. Gould's point, like, optional and voluntary it wouldn't be something that like if we were adding academics back at seven o'clock we, we wouldn't we wouldn't start up we wouldn't start the school day before 8 30 unless it was a voluntary additional course that a student wanted to take like tok right mm -hmm. theory knowledge and, and i will say to wearing my athletic hat um you know in the summer especially now that we're starting earlier um bhsl has uh rules now that you can't hold practices if the if it's too hot in the afternoon so that we ran into that a lot with the earlier start date this year so football would have to practice at 6 a.m before school so this actually helps football because it would but not football all, anyone any sport starting early in the morning because of the heat they could now start a half hour later because school would be starting later so it'd be nice any other thoughts from um start time conversations either with secondary staff or parents Yes, Vice, Dr. Anderson. I almost called you Vice Chair. I almost promoted you there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Tate would have been thrilled about that. <laughs> He's like, take it. Um, uh, 
Yeah, so this has been a this has been a fun process to go through. I will say um, it's been fun to hear from all the teachers, all the all the all the parents who have been able to email in, also to kind of uh, chime in. Um, and I think uh, you know uh, we, we've heard a lot. Uh, I've heard a lot from uh, secondary parents that just say, yeah, yeah, my kid would love to sleep. Um, and I think being able to accommodate that within a shortened day and ensure that it doesn't kind of impact the afternoon activities is, uh, I think, a, would be a great thing. I would. I would say that I think you know that that extra time should be protected. So I mean, I know, I know, you, I know you mentioned the TOK class, uh, and that's you know sort of voluntary. Um, but also, if you're trying to do the IB diploma, you might try to squeeze that in just so you can squeeze in more things here. If there was a zero, uh, if there was a zero block, and I think you know we want to encourage kids. Like while we want to, you know, we don't want to discourage kids from doing too much. Um, we do want to encourage them to make good choices. Um, and so I think ensuring that that amount of time that we're giving them in the morning is protected so that they are able to take advantage of that because I think one thing that I've uh, heard from some parents is you know why are we considering you know pushing it back to 8 30 that's only 25 minutes uh, and you know you know I mentioned you know the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics you know they, they recommend no no start time later than 8 30 and, and I, I want to kind of at least share that you know there's been a lot of research I've because because I because I am me I'm a statistician I uh, dove into the literature reviews and the research and all that and um, just kind of see how applicable it is to us and you know all the research shows not only do is um, the academic performance improve but also mood uh, mental health uh, measures those also improve and I think those are probably uh, a bigger part of the reason why we're doing this uh, because I think you know we do very well in academic performance but I think it's important to kind of uh, allow that kind of uh, good uh, uh, good health hygiene uh, to kind of spread throughout the uh, school community and even those studies showing a half hour increase in sleep show the exact same things and even those studies that show an 8 to 8 30 start uh, so there are a few there's like a small small few of those show those exact same benefits so I think it's important to kind of for the community to know that these benefits do accrue even with just the kind of short amount of time that we're considering um, I do want to kind of uh, bring it back to the elementary parents because they they would be impacted I've heard the same thing as Ms. Silverman has about the difficulty that a four o'clock release would uh, would impose on families trying to do things after school school um, and I know that uh, I imagine a, a fair amount of the teachers at uh, at Oak Street don't really see it as equitable uh, to go to have students 10 minutes longer than than Mount Daniel and I would say I don't either um, and I think you know I feel like we should be able to accommodate uh, a 30 minute lunch for all students within the amount of time that we already have um, so I would encourage uh, as, as much uh, as, as much effort to go into that as possible. Could I just uh, clarify one thing? You don't have to take the zero hour TOK to get the IB diploma. <laughs> so if you're if you're on if it, you can yeah just to make just to make sure everybody knows you don't have to take it in the zero hour to get the IB diploma. Yeah. But thank thank you, um, Dr. Anderson. That's something that you know we, we can look at for sure. Yeah, I think uh, getting back to the zero hour, I think that's part of it. And I'm looking at Dr. Dimick down there. Um, you know, I know her son does the zero hour, so he can do band and the IB diploma. Is that right, Dr. Dimick? Okay. So um, so I think it is one of those things where it's um, you know we, we would hate to people we would hate for students to have to decide. I'm gonna, I'd rather do band and just not do the IB diploma. So, but your point is well taken that you know. It, as much as we can um, make sure our kids are de-stressed as much as possible is good. I, I thought Dr. Noonan, you know, one of the things when Dr. Anderson was talking, um, one of the things that I think we've heard a couple times is, could you just flip flop and start? Um, you know, we can't we can't push secondary to nine because then we're laying out at four. You, you know, four, and then that backs everything up. And so, um, and the reason we can't flip flop, I thought, if you wanted to talk about the agreement with Fairfax County and Mount Daniel, so we could explain that. Yeah, just to, to make sure that everybody in the public knows that when we did the um, addition and renovation to Mount Daniel, there was an agreement with the um, Fairfax County um, Board uh, uh, Board of Supervisors. Um, as a result of some long, long and, and hard conversations with the homeowners association up at in Mount Daniel, um, that limits the time that school can run um, at the from from the morning to the afternoon, and there's a window of opportunity there that you have. 
Um, and I believe that window starts at 8.45 and ends at 4 in the afternoon. So we can't really move too much around there. Um, and so, uh, so that's, a, that's sort of a big deal for us. We did contemplate going back to um, the county and reopening um, conversations uh, around the agreement. Um, the agreement also, by the way, limits the number of students that we can have at Mount Daniel to 660. Um, and we're not close, so we're, we're in good shape there, which is good. Um, but we, we felt that um, if we opened, it's kind of like the conversation that we had about legislation. If we open that conversation, it could actually backfire on us, and there could be more restrictive um, covenants put, put on the schools. And um, we believe that it probably would take at least a year for us to get any kind of reasonable information out of, out of that process. So our council um, outside of uh, Falls Church City and internally both advise that we, we shouldn't actually look at that uh, agreement. Thank you, Dr. Newton, for that context. Yes, Ms. Silverman. I just want to voice my agreement with uh, Dr. Anderson um, about, um, it, it, you know, possibly being in favor of this, but make, you know, ensuring that elementary start times and end times wouldn't be touched um, for the same reasons. Um, and having that extended Oak Street time, um, I agree with Dr. Anderson, is probably um, not going to be seen as equitable amongst the teachers and staff at the one campus. Um, so, you know, if, if elementary remains untouched, then, um, you know, that's something that I think, you know, this could be a viable option. Thank you, Ms. Silverman. Any other comments? That's, yes. that's why all these are drafts. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ms. Tice. I was, I was just going to say the same thing that my two colleagues had just driven home. I'm, I would rather see, I mean, I would rather see Oak Street start at 9, 10, if we're going to stagger the afternoons and also stagger the morning so that it's the same amount of time. Though I will also say you can't please all the parents because the parents who drive, I'm sure, love the stagger. And the parents who are sitting at the bus stop probably would not love the stagger because it's longer waiting for one kid to leave and come back. So you can't win it all. That is for sure. Thank you, Ms. Tice. Any other, any other comments or feedback on uh, the, the discussion of start times? Yes, Dr. Ortiz. <coughs> Um, and then maybe this, I'm, I'll direct this to Dr. Anderson because he's delved into literature more. Are the benefits associated with, you know, obviously the American uh, Academy of Pediatrics put out a, a benchmark of 8.30 in the morning. Um, you, know, I, you know, I don't know exactly where that came from, but, um, and, um, but we've had um, here in the district some rejiggering of the transportation schedule, which has moved, you know, I think just speaking personally, um, our bus stop time seven or eight minutes or something like that and I've seen a, like, a tremendous improvement in the ability to manage my household morning as a result of that incremental amount of time so the question I have is you know that's obviously n equals one or two I guess um, so you know do we have is there general evidence in the literature that incremental changes to the start time of incremental benefits yeah, I think, you know, just from uh, sleep, sleep studies in general, like the, the dose is like, there, there's the dose response. Um, so the more sleep you get, the better it is. Uh, but any sleep that you get extra is good. Yes, Dr. Dimmick. I guess I just wanted to reiterate um, from our meetings with the, with the staff at, the, at both elementary schools, the equity issue over the different times at the elementaries was an issue and they also raised the issue of staff that work at both schools and go between both schools and how would that work if the schools were on um, different times and then just to sort of add into this let's I guess well I while I am in favor of 830 since that maximizes the time if we had to do 820 to make the buses work for the elementary that would still get us more sleep Height at the secondary campus than they're getting now. And on the buses, my son's bus did change, but then it flipped right back because it couldn't make it to school on time. So, so that was. <laughs> Speaking of that, have we, have we been able to do many test runs? Um, Ms. Michael, I, I know, was working on it with um, who's online tonight. Thank you for being here on your vacation. Um, but uh, she, she has been working with Regina to look at those times, and there have been a couple of test runs. Um, we think that it's doable, right? It looks like it. I'm going to look at 
She's nodding. Yes, with, we do. With enthusiasm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. As soon as the construction stops. <laughs> well, I, I know I've sort of joked about this, not joked, but suggested about this, but I, I know, and I'm not going to get ahead of us, but we do have a budget item coming up, but I know we have tabled some of the budget, Why not, you know, with, with the electric buses. I mean, it is something to sort of, I don't know, keep in our, maybe we need to, to make this work. I don't know. Do we need to, or add, you know, instead of. Right. Add to our fleet. I'm not putting the electric piece aside, but, yeah. you know, do we need to expand the fleet by maybe two buses or something like that? I know we need more bus drivers and that, but I'm just, I'm just wondering if it's, if it always seems, it already seems kind of tight this year. Yes. To tag on to that Monday. I believe we received an announcement that one of the buses broke down, but there was not another bus, so they would have to wait for a second run. And I know that my kid and his HOA, the, all the HOA classes were in Gettysburg with a bus, um, but that made me think, ooh, do we, do we need more buses? We, we have a number of reserve buses. They, they just are not working as well. So um, <laughs> unfortunately, we've, we've, um, we've been using some of them for parts and the like. But um, you know, any time we can get two more buses into our fleet, it's optimal for sure. So that, that's a conversation for another day. But it might, it might be interesting to, you know, we have we've got some money sort of set to the side. So maybe that's a good conversation for later about that. OK, any, any other? Questions, comments, thoughts about uh, start times. OK. So we're going to move on now to um, the subject of early release. And um, again, we uh, just, as I said at the outset, uh, we did meet with staff at Jesse Thackeray Preschool at both uh, Mount Daniel and Oak Street. And then we, w we met with secondary staff. And then we had a, a town hall at Oak Street a uh, town hall at the secondary uh, for parents and a town hall at the Meridian for parents. And then we actually just had one at the community center on Sunday. And again, we're going to be meeting with the ESOL community and students um, coming up. So uh, just to kind of organize our conversation a little bit, I thought we'll start with um, talking about what we heard from staff. And if anyone wants to, I think we were all um, surprised by our conversation at Jesse Thackeray, if anyone wants to talk about that. Yes, Dr. Anderson. Yeah, so I think I think the kind of heterogeneity and diversity of uh, thought on uh, early release Wednesdays across the schools was something that uh, surprised all of us. Um, I think we all kind of uh, figured that you know elementary school would want to hold on to the time that they have to uh, ensure that they get the professional development and the planning time that they uh, that that's there for them. That that way that they can be more more effectively teach. Um, we figured they want to hold on to that. Uh, one thing that I don't think we thought was that there was a significant number of secondary teachers who said that they didn't want any more half day Wednesdays. And then we get to Jesse Thackeray, and they're like, we want to get rid of uh, the early release Wednesdays and go to a slightly shorter but consistent uh, daily schedule. Um, and having uh, you know had bo both my boys went to Jesse Thackeray, and uh, I think as a parent, I probably would have appreciated that. And uh, and like. Having seen, uh, seen seen Jesse Thackeray in action, I can imagine why they would also want to kind of change up the schedule. And so that was uh, that was something that I think uh, was a surprise to us all. And so they, it, I remember it was, it was that was a great uh, town hall. We were all got, you know a lot of us were gathered there. We were all sitting in the uh, preschool chairs, um, and uh, the uh, a, lo a lot of the uh, staff were were there in the same room, and they were able to just kind of it was almost. I imagine nearly unanimous, uh, if not unanimous, uh, that that was that, that they thought that was the better option for them, uh, and so that was that was something that I think shocked us all. And then it was fun to try to get out of those preschool <laughs> chairs, but uh, no, I, I think in, in the idea is that it would provide more consistency for those young ones. And I know Miss Sharp, I thought you you told me something very interesting, and thank you for joining us that day. Uh, Ms. Sharp told me afterwards too that you know part of the the beauty of Jesse Thackeray is we we have peer students and we have students with special needs and you know they, these students all are together in classrooms but it's harder to market that to the to peers um, when there's an early release Wednesday when people really need this for as a childcare is that would that be accurate Ms. Sharp. So I thought that was really interesting piece of it too. That you know that would help them maybe attract some families who who had had walked away from it because of that early release Wednesday. So that was interesting. Uh, what what did you all think about? We we actually met two different times with Mount Daniel. Uh, what, any thoughts from our conversations there? 
Yes, Vice Trugal. Yeah, I, I I think it was interesting how the the Mount Daniel opened. Um, the 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 person who spoke uh, mentioned that this is a <laughs> this is this decision for early release Wednesdays is always talked about uh, as a benefit for teachers, and it was very clear that they said this is actually for the students, not for the teachers. Um, this allows them to be a better teacher and show up better for for their kids. Um, so this is actually a benefit for. Um, for the students and I thought it was just very well articulated. I think the other thing that we've heard a lot from the elementary schools is why are we doing this? What's the, what's the, is this about childcare or is there something academically missing that we need to plug by trying to have the students uh, in school and I think that's been a recurring question that we've received um, and 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 I think that the the point that was made at least in the Mount Daniel and the Oak Street was if this is about childcare are we looking in the right place to fix this, are we looking? Are by reducing early release Wednesdays, is that the right option, or could we be? I think creative is probably the the, the term we keep hearing. Um, can we be creative and try to figure out the childcare issue to allow teachers to be better teachers for their students? And so I think that's been a recurring theme um, that that we've heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think, and it, it's interesting that you talked about the um, one of the teachers saying, you know, this helps us be better teachers. The second time we went to Mount Daniel, they told us that right before we came, they were in a, a professional development session where they were, where they were talking about how do you deal with a student who says no, which you can imagine in Mount Daniel, that's all the time. But, um, but you know, I think to your point, that's you know, that's the kind of things that that net, that wouldn't take a full day of professional development, right? That could be an hour session about let, let's how do we how do we tackle this when the kid is telling you no consistently? So I thought that was interesting. The same same sort of thing. Like this is it is helpful for them to to be better teachers. Any um, yes, Miss Tice. Uh, Yes, I mean, I just think that this whole process has been really valuable because it's a it's a really legitimate question to be asking. And while probably a lot of the drive was from was concern about child care concerns, I do think it was a really good question that we should revisit not every year or every five years, but, you know, periodically because nobody else in the region is doing it. So I think it's a good question to ask. Is this still the best way to serve our students by and to support our teachers? And we heard. It depends, right? It depends on the age. It depends on the school. It depends on the setting. So it wasn't, uh, wasn't black and white. So I think it was really valuable to hear all the answers. I think it depends on uh, the different demographics and um, the value of full day professional development versus half day professional development and planning vertically and horizontally. And that looks different across our school system. And you can't compare us to other school systems because they have different demographics and different schedules and, and different challenges. So I think it was just a really good question to ask. Um, so I think it's unfortunate that it was only pigeonholed as a, as a child care issue because I think coming from an instructional standpoint and what serves our teachers and students best, it was also a question worth asking. Um, and I really, really am so grateful for all of the teachers and community members that engaged in the process because I think we, I don't generally speak for the board, but I think I'm comfortable saying that we all learned a lot from each of these eight meetings we've had so far. Um, so I just wanted to also thank everybody for engaging in the process. Um, and I think it will be um, a, a productive challenge to keep being creative and figuring out that child care piece um, without it yeah, um, muddying the instructional planning professional development um, piece of it. Thank you, Ms. Tice. Any other thoughts from our conversation at Mount Daniel? Yes, Dr. Ortiz. I think I just, I'd like to um, maybe um, take what um, Ms. Tice said and, and, and be a little bit more specific, I think, about what I heard, and if it's different than what you all heard, um, then, 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 we, then, we, then I think we can discuss more. Um, you, you know, what we've, you know, what we've heard from the staff is that they do have um, a good amount of time for, um, and, and you know, this is just me, this is terms I use, I don't know if they're used in the schools, horizontal planning. The third grade teachers can get together, they can work with each other, they can figure out what's working, what's not working. They can do that on a very regular basis. Um, the early release Wednesdays are used for professional development. If we didn't have them, I think we would be committed to finding ways to get them professional development regardless, right? So I don't think, you know, I don't necessarily think that's necessarily dispositive here. But the piece of it that, that, that I think makes us, like, that, that we're challenged to think about creatively 
is this, you know, you know, again, for lack of a better term, vertical planning time, which is the paraprofessional with the reading specialist, with the math specialist, and the classroom teacher talking about individual, individual student cases or better strategies for delivering those kind of cross services. And that planning time and that time to work through that, those issues is not built in to the schedule as it is. I don't, you know, I don't manage the school, so I don't know how you would do it otherwise. Right, you know, and you know, I'm not going to give Peter, you know, Dr. You, you can extend but, the school day by another hour. Yeah, <laughs> like, and then we'd have to find something, yeah. to do, right? You know, so you know, and 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 that's a, a challenge. But at the same time, you know, if having a dedicated afternoon is the only way that we can achieve that on a regular basis, and I think the other piece we heard is that if you just do it once a month, it's not enough to provide the interventions that are needed. Right, so I think that's those are the two pieces. One is it's used in a way that's different than we had anticipated, and then second, that it's needed, it needs to be regular or else it's not useful. Um, and so, you know, that's the question that I have is like, have we thought on both sides of that? You know, creatively about, you know, the fact that this is a burden on a lot of families, um, but on the other on the other half of it is, is there are there creative ways to make that happen on a pretty regular basis? Like it wouldn't happen every day, like we have for some other things. And, you know, I don't know, the, you know, the, the answer is probably we could figure something out, but if we have to take away from something in order to make that happen, you know, I don't know if that trade-off is worth it. But I'd, I'd like to know, right? So I think that's the question that I have in my mind, you know, and, and I don't know, you know, you know, certainly the exist of status quo works, but it's the, it's, you know, have we thought through all the options there? And I think we've, at le you know, through the benefit of having talked and engaged with the staff, I think we've identified the, the key crux Am I, am, am I, that's, that's the one that I heard. I know that there's others, but, you know, I, th I think that's the, that's the key one that, that we would need to think through. And if this is, you know, if that's the only way to really make that happen, because it really, um, uh, because that's just the way it works, if having really, really someone's is the only way to make that happen, then that seems fine to me. It's just, I think we should, you know, really think through it. And, and I would, if I may, I, I might expand your definition of vertical to beyond just the integration of special services, like social workers, school counselors, et cetera to be in grade level vertical. So if I'm a third grade teacher, uh, I want to be able to meet with the fourth grade teacher to make sure that the skills and, and content and body of knowledge that I'm teaching is actually matching what they need by the time the students get there. I also want to be able to meet with the second grade teacher so that I can say to that second grade teacher, hey, here's where some of those students are really falling down, if you can redouble your efforts here. So we, we speak about it just in terms of you know vernacular. We, horizontal planning, right, what, that you described, so by grade level, and then vertical teaming. Vertical teaming is that north-south, sort of up and down the grade um, level. And that is, um, that is the challenge for every school division in the country. Um, you can do one, but you can't do both um, it, without, any, uh, without building in time. So in my past divisions, um, the way that we've been able to build in that vertical teaming time is by adding days to the schedule. Um, so there's professional de development days that are built in, um, but the horizontal teams, the grade level teams, the content teams are still able to meet on a, on a very routine basis. It's just uh, virtually impossible to do a schedule where you're doing both because of the way, uh, for example, when, when students are off um, and not in a classroom with their grade level teacher, they have to be somewhere else. And where are they going to be? They're, they're either in PE, they're in music, they're in art. Um, and that works by grade level, but if you start adding another grade level in with that, you're doubling the number of kids that then go into a, an art or a music, et cetera. So it's a very complicated um, process to do just to get it to, to be able to do the horizontal. So hopefully that helps a little bit with some of the thinking. Thank you, Dr. Noon. Yes, Dr. Dimmick. Um, I guess I want to take us back to the secondary for a minute. I guess I was, we had great, what to my mind great turnout at our elementary schools about this issue and they're perhaps more affected by changes to this issue than the secondary campus um, but I think it was a little mixed at the secondary campus there were people who were definitely not in favor of of an additional early release um, some other folks mentioned teacher retention and um, um, so, sort of it being a social emotional wellness issue for students to have that break um, but I do think back to when we had the administrators here and they stressed, yes, there is more we could do. Um, and I guess I, I guess I, I wish we could hear from more of the secondary campus. Um, and I guess I would put out there that I, I, 
while I'm not sure that I see adding two a month for the secondary campus, if they need more professional development or, as you just said, different, you know, do the math classes line up, do the social studies classes line up, if that can only happen once a month when they have professional development scheduled, is there enough going on there? Um, so I guess I'd like to know more. Yes, Ms. Tice. Uh, I was literally just writing the same notes down. <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Dimmick. You said it well. Um, I just, I feel like when we, the parent feedback that we've gotten, which we got a lot of attendance at the town halls and also a lot of emails last spring. Um, and the majority of parents who were against early release Wednesdays were coming from a child care perspective. And the majority of parents that were, um, that were supportive of early release Wednesdays were either from the social emotional benefits of giving these kids the time off or um, wanting to support teachers and giving teachers what they needed. Um, and the teachers were so united at the, at the preschool and at the elementary schools and it really did feel mixed at the secondary. Um, so I would welcome more feedback from the secondary um, staff at this point. Yeah, I, th I think that is that's true to you know maybe the secondary staff because I think Dr. Noonan you, you had said too that there is maybe some surprises that I don't know might be might be interesting to hear to hear from from more secondary staff if because there is the, yeah. the that another couple that, you know early release Wednesdays might help with providing more professional development and and, and one way to sort of think about that too is. Um, uh, it, again, in another district where I've served, there were um, the standalone automatics half day once a month, and then there were two or three other flexible. And if you gave a month's notice to the community, hey, this Wednesday we are going. This Wednesday, four weeks from now, we're going to we're going to use a half day. Um, it, it it is helpful um, from a number of perspectives. One is you can be responsive to some things that might be happening happening in the curriculum. Um, but if they're not used, they're not used. So um, I, I'm I'm sort of surprised. I, and I, you know, I, I can we can certainly send out a flyer, you know, if you will, to the to the secondary folks and say, hey, please, if you have some thoughts on this, let you know. I can't, you know, secondary teachers d don't always um, aren't as organized necessarily as sort of the, the elementary teachers around big things. But the other thing to consider too is if you're not hearing from them, it might just be it's not a big deal. Um, so. I think you, you know one of the things I know about our staff is if they have an opinion, they're going to let it be heard. Um, but anyway, just just a couple of thoughts there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's interesting, and that might be some. You know, one of the proposals um, was to have everything aligned, and not that you know not, we're not getting into the we don't dig into that nitty gritty, but but it, it would be interesting. You know, those kind of months. Um, you know, I always bring up March. I'm sure Sean would agree. Like March is the it feels like eight months just the month of March. So, you know, that might be a good month to have two early release Wednesdays at the secondary campus. It gives our students a little mental health break, which they need because they're, it's right, because the spring break's still a ways away. And it also maybe frees up some time for an extra professional development session or something. So maybe it's that something like that could be looked at as just maybe adding one or two here or there on, on the longer months where there's no break. Um, but. Uh, so we so we were talking about Mont Daniel. I don't know if there's anything specific to Oak Street. If anyone remembers, yes, Miss Silverman. I, I was not at Oak Street, unfortunately, but I um, do have a question about. I think um, you were on via Zoom. I, I was on via you Zoom, on, so I was you were, you were trying there to listen on a computer, yes. as as best as I could. Um, some of the sometimes the audio wasn't wasn't the best, but um, I was just curious if um, the plan was if if we were going to keep. Um, early release for elementary if Mount Daniel and Oak Street would have like the same types of professional development each Wednesday and kind of how that's all coordinated um, I, I, I I just want to make sure that um, you know both campuses are, are treated similarly in terms of the types of professional development they receive it really is site dependent um, and so I, I don't think that it's going to be equivalent or exact across both um, for the most part for example um, all of the teachers at Mount Daniel have now completed um, their their training in uh, um, Orton Gillingham training, um, so they're done. They don't need that, but there's still some teachers at at Oak Street that need that, so they may get some Orton Gillingham training on those Wednesdays. Um, so so there there's a couple of things that we've been discussing. 
Um, and that is, you know, how prescriptive are we or have we been with those Wednesdays and how prescriptive do we want to be? And one of the things that we've discussed is there's a lot of training that we need to do from the central office staff. Um, for example, Jen Fessenden and uh, Ann Boletto need to do a lot of work in math and in reading um, support. Um, so we, we've talked about potentially working with principals and some staff to say, could two of those days be sort of central-based uh, central professional development, and then could two of those days, presuming you keep four, if not, you know, we'd, we'd have to look at it differently, and then two of those days are site-based, because the site-based professional development that's going to be different across both schools is equally important to the central um, professional development. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Silverman. Yes, Mr. Gould. Yeah, you asked about Oak Street specifically. Yeah, I thought the uh, Oak Street conversation, uh, one of the parts was centered around the um, understanding of how special education services are provided, especially in terms of the IEP and the coordination and the significant amount of time and meetings that go into the IEP meetings. Um, and they talked about how specifically paraprofessionals are able to meet versus trying to pull teachers out, trying to squeeze this in. Um, they said, that, and, and they said very specifically, they said uh, quality versus quantity. Yes, that other schools can do IEPs outside of an early release Wednesday, but the concept of them being able to focus on this and have dedicated time allows them to think about it, be more thoughtful about how they approach it, work as a team versus kind of checking it off, at least the schools that I worked, I do remember, unfortunately, doing that when you don't have a lot of time. Um, so I thought that was really interesting from the special education um, population, how they approach that. So, yeah. yeah. I think that's a great point and actually something that a parent brought up uh, at the community town hall on Sunday. And I, I use the example of my son um, was in speech therapy, so had an IEP for speech therapy. And I think those community members who don't haven't gone through the IEP process may not be aware but when you go in and I'm looking at Ms. Sharp it's it's like an army of staff people there you have to have you have a para you have the te classroom teacher you have the speech pathologist you have the principal at least and that, so it's at least probably four adults plus the parent so to try to find a time that everyone can sit down it's impossible and so quite often when I had my IEP meetings about my son um, for, with the speech for his speech um, it was often on early release Wednesday so I think that is and I know that was one something that not to go, go to parent feedback already but that was something that was echoed just this past Sunday when we met with the parents but thank you that's a great point Vice Chair Gould. Any other thoughts from our conversation at, at Oak Street? Um, Dr. Newton, I thought if you before we um, move on to talk um, a little bit more uh, from secondary could you talk about um, one of the things that I think was a theme both at both elementary schools was just time and I thought if you could just give us a brief 101 on you know I know we talk about 180 days but also looking at things like hours and that we actually have you know one of the things that that's um, come up and I think Vice Chair Gould talked about this is you know why, why are, is this, dis are we having this discussion because we're not in school as much as other schools? And so I thought it's an interesting thing for the public to know that we actually, even with the early release Wednesdays, we still do well with how, how long we're in school. Yeah, um, so thank you uh, for that question. Um, when we, and, and I, I, I'll do a one-on-one, -on -one, not for you because you know this, but maybe more for the community, but when we develop our school calendar and now you've codified it in policy, we always start with 180 days. Um, and our teacher contracts um, are seven and a half hours uh, of time. And then, um, and so, and then there's a particular amount of contact with kids within that period of time. Um, each year, once we have that 180-day calendar in place, we hope that we don't have a bad winter <laughs> and don't have to make a snow call. Um, because in the event that there is a need for a school closure, we move away then from the requirement of 180 days, which is what we build our calendar on, 
and we drop back to the 990 hour threshold because we're not going to be able to meet the 180 days unless we extend the school year. So in order for us to meet that 990 hour threshold, we do an evaluation each year of our schools to determine how much time are we going to school. Um, and, and I'm so glad you asked this question, and you didn't tell me you were going to ask it. But I, I know, I felt bad. I'm like, <laughs> did I put him on the spot? No, no, I have in front of me, actually, the amount of time that we go to school each year, um, just so you know, in terms of hours. So um, part of our process is that we build in time for snow days. Um, so that we don't have to make them up, right? So we drop to the 990 hours. We currently go to school at the elementary level. This includes half-day Wednesdays, 1,128 hours, 1,128 hours a, a year. That builds in a lot of time for us beyond the 990 hours in case of any kind of snow. At the high school level, we go to school 1,129 hours, so one hour longer at the high school, a little less than one hour actually when you get down to the minutes. There are, it's, it's complicated to um, describe exactly how this time is calculated because there are some things that count and some things that don't count. There are some things that count that didn't used to count. So for example, uh, for a long time until just the last five years or so, you weren't allowed to count recess into instructional time. We now are allowed to include recess in instructional time. So that 1,128 hours at the elementary school includes time with teachers, it includes recess, but it doesn't include lunch, for example. So we have to back out the lunch period during, during those calculations. Um, so, so we now have a, a in place a system where we meet the threshold of 180 hours. If indeed we have a snowmageddon like we had, you know, 10 years ago, and we were out for 10 days, um, that's you know 80 hours roughly, maybe a little less than 80 hours. Um, we've got enough time built in to be able to accommodate that without having to extend the school year. Now, the other thing that I think is equally important to know <coughs> is that. We did a small analysis of some surrounding school divisions. We looked at Loudoun, we looked at Fairfax, and we looked at Arlington. Each of those school divisions go to school longer than we do. We actually have the shortest amount of minutes in the region of any of the, er, in the close-in region of any of the schools. So our teachers and our, our, not our teachers, our students are getting less minutes than any other surrounding jurisdiction is. So I think that that's not great. Uh, it's, not a, it's not something you want to like hold the flag on and say our kids go to school the least. Um, but the truth of it is, is our, our kids do go to school the least in terms of minutes from surrounding schools. So uh, even though we have those days built in, other school systems have even more days built in. May, may I ask, because um, I think Loudoun has only 100, I think they build their calendar on 175 days. So they still have more. They, they have there. 1,100 and, oh, I'm sorry, that's not loud. <coughs> Excuse me, 1,155 hours of instruction at the elementary and 1,150 hours at the secondary. If, yes, if I so add, I'm sorry to interrupt. Loudon had uh, built their calendar with a shorter number of days last school year that. only, but that was corrected this year. Yeah, they've gone to 180 days. Thank you, Ms. Michael. Yes, Ms. Silverman. I'm sure Loudon got a lot of heat for being at 175 days. Uh, I just want to say thank you for all those calculations because I know that it's been brought up to us about the fact that we have more hours than what is required. And um, while law, I, I believe the law should be the bottom and not the place that we should be achieving to be. Um, so it's, again, we don't want to hang a flag and say we have the least amount of hours in the area but I think it is just great to recognize the fact that we while we are over the, the lowest point that we need to be we are not excessively high either so that's that's right. good to know yeah we, we are sort of at the at the low end for sure um, if if we had a six and a half hour student day um, and and maintained um, uh, 990 hours only our students would go to school for 157 days. And that's just not enough for us to be able to do the work we need to do. So I'm, I'm proud that we're in 180 days. I don't want to shorten the day. Um, I, I think we're already too low. That's interesting, too, because I think for those of us who were at the second Mount Daniel Town Hall, 
that was not what was communicated to us by a staff member. So I think that's, that's thank you for, for that information. Yes, Ms. Tice. Yes, I think that came up at the Oak Street one also. Um, so it's good to have accurate information. That's really helpful. So thank you also for those calculations. I'm just curious how that changes with the 15 minute 15 minute reduction at the sec potential 15 minute reduction at the secondary campus would it would it be a straight my 15 times 180 minus uh, we'd have to see where minutes. we took the time from okay. um, if we took it out of um, classrooms it would be an immediate reduction if it comes out of passing periods it might not be just make them all run just run between those classes. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone <laughs> has to <laughs> locker to go to. But, yeah, we, took our time. Running shoes but we did do the out. calculations, and we'd still be okay with uh, the hours Got if it. we reduced even by a straight 15. Okay. It would be, it would be interesting to ha when we get to a final product here. It would be interesting to have those numbers. Just we'll make um, sure we provide those. Once you tell us the decision that you want to make, we can run the right. calculations. It's for really you. helpful, and then when we hear misinformation in the community, it just helps us um, explain. Thank you, Ms. Tice. Any other? Okay. Um, I know we already touched briefly on uh, secondary uh, staff and, and their um, views on early release Wednesdays. And I think we heard from just a few staff about that. So, again, maybe Dr. Noonan, we can um, just put a. And, and I think actually, I'll talk with you about this offline, just one or two more emails to your staff. just. Uh, you know, email this. Feel free to email sure. the school board, and you know Happy that sort that. of thing. Um, okay. Anything else before we move on to parent feedback about anything else on the staff side about <coughs> early release? Okay. Um, thank you. I, I'll just say my one plug. I will say what, it really caught my attention tonight was when uh, Mr. Finneran was talking about that there's a thousand open teacher slots in the state of Virginia, and I think. Um, you know, we've been lucky, you know, even after COVID, we haven't seen tremendous turnover. We've been really lucky. But, you know, I, th I know I've said this before, but, um, you know, looking at it from a workforce lens, um, you know, if we're competing with Arlington and Arlington is painted a little bit more, is this something that attracts a teacher? This is a really creative thing that this teacher is going to have Wednesdays for either professional development or vertical planning. Uh, you know, th is this something that helps morale? I, we know it helps morale. Um, teachers have a bit of time to breathe and meet, and, um, you know, it definitely seems like a big morale booster. This is something that doesn't affect our budget. Uh, you know, these are contract hours. So I think, you know, again, it just really, it's sort of, you know, and I've also said this, but I'll say it again, that Dr. Noon and I were at a meeting recently with area superintendents and um, school board members, and, you uh, one of the, the superintendent from Fairfax was talking about training teachers and the superintendent from Loudoun County st stood up and said, there are no teachers. So I just think, you know, I, I think that is something that if this is sort of our, our secret weapon to keep, to attract teachers, to keep teachers, to keep morale high, I think it's just something that, you know, again, looking at that workforce lens. So that's just my, my piece of, while we're talking about staff feedback. Okay, so let's um, move on now to the, um, feedback from uh, the parent community. Uh, we met with, um, we were at Oak Street Elementary uh, one night. If someone, if anyone wants to talk about that specific evening. Yes, Dr. Dimmick. I guess, can I just give an overview? Yes, for please. Of, from yes. my perspective, yes. I, you know, we've been talking about this for quite a while now, and we've had a number of town hall meetings with the community, and I must say that I am surprised how lopsided the community feedback is. They are supportive of the early release Wednesdays. They want what is best for the teachers and the students. And I, I guess I expected to hear more from, you know, we had maybe one parent here and one parent there, maybe a you know, couple uh, who were in favor of reduced early release Wednesdays, but I, I really was surprised that we didn't, there w wasn't, there wasn't great, you know, and there was no outpouring. And we also take emails, so. It's yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I think it was interesting, those who attended both the Oak Street and then the community, um, one on Sunday, 
I I noticed sort of the same thing happen in both of those situations where there were definitely there were uh, you know one or two um, parents who in both sessions talked about that it is a struggle for them for the child care and um, you know that this is something that's um, and even if you know you have a student with special needs like one of the community members has it it's definitely it can be a burden um, but what was interesting in both those situations is I think we sort of sat back and watched the parents talk to each other and I think as the parents talked the the way that the conversation evolved in both situations at the community center and at oak street i think the parents who talked to, began by saying this is a real burden started to see like yes it is a burden but it's all you know both things can be true right so so it is but this is also something that is something that is going to keep my great teacher here it makes my great teacher happy that they have this this um you know perk so i think that was really interesting for all of us to sort of sit back and watch the these conversations evolve and i think that was what what we found so enlightening about these town halls is that really a nice exchange of ideas and everyone felt like they it was a safe space to say what they were feeling and just kind of watching um everyone listen to each other's perspectives but yeah i, I do agree with you dr dimick i think that um as people have learned about some of the um, benefit, some of how these early release Wednesdays are, are used. And, and you know, think you think about your actual teacher, your child's teacher, and think about how that your child's teacher really wants. It, it just makes a difference. Um, I will say, you know, that the, the elephant in the room it, it is, is the daycare issue, the child care issue. And so um, I thought, Dr. Noonan, if, and I, and I will go back, you know, I don't want to skip over our other conference, but if you maybe could talk a little bit, I, I know, Back in the day, we might have offered some early release, just Wednesday childcare. But what? And, and one of the things that came up on Sunday also was someone was saying, "Well, maybe the reason we haven't heard more is that people's needs are being met." And and I know that you, we were talking about this, and you you had said, um, you know, that families that are using FCCPS daycare have that Wednesday covered. Um, do you think that there'd be any more additional need for just a Wednesday only option? Well, I don't know. I was going to ask. <laughs> <You want? laughs> but, no, no, I, I sort of say that tongue in cheek. Um, you know, right now, th that is correct. If you're at Oak Street or you're at Mount Daniel and you're in the after school program, you get the Wednesday already, that benefit. Um, we do offer parents the Wednesday only option, but they do currently have to pay for the Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday option as well. Um, that being said, we've done a, f a pretty significant dive into trying to figure out how we might be able to do a Wednesday only option. And there are a number of barriers, and I, I just need to put them out there because it's not as simple as just standing up a Wednesday program. Um, and the first, the first um, sort of barrier that's not insurmountable, none of these are insurmountable, they just are there, is, um, is staffing. Um, for us to be able to find staff that will only work for a couple hours on a Wednesday is really challenging. Um, and so there have been some questions like, could paraprofessionals do it in the afternoons? Um, and, and one thing I will tell you about our paraprofessionals is if they're cut out of Wednesday professional development, we'll have mutiny on our hands because our paraprofessionals really believe that they want to be part of um, the professional um, expectations that are on, on offer from us. That being said, there is a core group of first grade paraprofessionals at Mount Daniel that do work part time. And we've gone to them and we've asked them, hey, do you have any interest in participating in sort of an after school Wednesday only? And we did have one person who stepped up and said that they might have some interest, maybe. Um, so, so barrier one would really be finding somebody that could just work for you know, three or four hours on a Wednesday only. The second barrier for us is really um, is space right now and where would we host that right now all of our um, spaces are used for the after school program um, and and for us to try to find more space we're then getting into teacher classrooms um, and again it just depends on the need if we have 20 kids we can probably absorb 20 kids pretty easily into the space that we have but if we have a hundred kids at at Mount Daniel and 100 kids at Oak Street, it's, it's a much more complicated process for us. Um, so trying to figure out where the space availability is would be something that we need to, need to figure out. And then the third challenge for us is, um, is financial. Um, and I know that there's some question out there about whether or not parents would pay for 
the Wednesday only option? Would there be transportation or not transportation? Um, and those are all decisions that, you know, you, you can kind of wrestle to the ground. I, I will say that we, we don't currently offer after school transportation on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. So the thought of offering it just on Wednesdays might be problematic for our staff to pick up extra shifts on one day as opposed to multiple. So there could be some staffing implications there. Um, so that, that doesn't mean that we're gonna not continue to sort of try to figure this out. Um, we, we are extremely creative people. Um, we pride ourselves on the creativity we have. At the same time, we also know that there are some barriers that creativity can't fix. And, and one of them is having staff available to actually do the work. Um, that being said, we also um, have had an opportunity for our community outreach folks to get in touch with um, Mr. Baruti to see if, if Mr. Baruti was interested in perhaps doing something on, on Wednesdays only. Uh, and he is, uh, from what I understand, considering that as an option. And he's got a stable of people that work for him currently that, that he may be able to do it. That could be a viable option that would run through the PTAs. Um, I'm going to bring it up at my next SAO meeting to see if, if the PTAs at, Oaks, at, at the elementary PTAs would be interested in perhaps sponsoring um, Baruti's on when, Baruti camps on Wednesday. Um, but again, we still face the same space issue that we currently face, um, depending on the number of students that we have. Um, we've been in contact with um, the general government and Park and Rec and Parks. Um, and they're not quite sure if they're going to run their program again. They had some real trouble staffing it, um, and they may or may not run their program. Um, so all that to say that those are, those are some things that we have considered. One of the creative options that we had sort of on our radar early, but it doesn't sound like sort of the solution would bear out here, is if we aligned the high school, middle school, secondary, um, Wednesdays with the elementary Wednesdays, we'd then open up the option of having a really big workforce because those high school students are all looking for part-time work. Um, but it, if, if the high school students are in school, when the elementary students are out, then we don't have that workforce um, available to us. So, so um, you know, and, and it doesn't sound like more at the secondary campus is really desirable. So. Um, if we were in the same situation that we're in now and it were status quo, um, I'd really like to know what the universe of people are that would even have an interest. Um, and we had actually sent you a, a copy of the, the survey that had been revised subsequent to the conversation several times. We sent you a work product as opposed to a final product. Um, and we actually leaned it out just to be, if, it, if there was something on offer, would you be interested? Yes or no, sort of an up or down, um, just to kind of get a sense for um, whether, whether or not people had an interest. And I, I, do think, I do think one of the questions that's sort of challenging to know is if we're serving, a, and I'm, I'll use just round numbers here, 150 kids in the daycare program at Mount Daniel and 150 kids at Oak Street, that's a pretty big group of students percentage-wise of the population of the school to begin with, and they're already getting the Wednesday, and you're hearing from a majority of parents that are not interested in um, doing anything with the Wednesdays, that they may have it already sorted out. I just don't, it's just hard to know what the, the number of people are. So it's probably more than you asked for, but. No, no, that, that's good. Yeah, I think, you know, it, it is hard to get, uh, put your, thumb on that number, like what that number would be. Um, and so one of the things that came up on Sunday was also what was interesting was one of the parents was saying her child does, the, I guess the broody has some things on Wednesday now, maybe not to the extent that we would, we would could they could expand more, I think. But the parent next to her said, oh, I didn't even know broody had some. So it just seemed that, um, and I think I talked to you about this, that maybe part of it too is that um, Katie Clinton, I hate to put this on her, but or someone on, on the school side could put together a one pager with just the various options for when, you know, once we can get it all together, whether it's Parks and Rec or Baruti Camp or FCCPS or what have you, the Taekwondo place over by Giant, you know, whatever it is, like, can we have a comprehensive list of, you know, different early release Wednesday? I think that would be a nice service to our community. So, Ms. Silverman. I have a few questions. Um, during COVID, I, I I believe it was a Wednesday only program that was held at Parks and Rec. 
um, so and they would, they would bus over to Parks and Rec. And then um, transportation, like a second bus run, wasn't even needed because pickup was at 6 p.m. So I think that's the – I know that you were explaining why would we do a second bus run for Wednesdays when we're not doing it for the other days. That would be because the release time, I'm assuming, on this Wednesday-only option would be at 3.50. I, I, I need to go back and double-check, but my understanding is that the Park and Rec's Wednesday program ended at 4.00. So we were or four, sure. yeah three fifty or four. So we were going to model the Wednesday only after mm -hmm. what Park and Recs were doing. Okay. So that's why you'd need that secondary bus run because it would end at three fifty or four if you were going to have one. Otherwise, parents would just pick up like they normally would pick up. Right, right. I mean, I, I, I don't see a need for a second bus run if it runs in, if the Wednesday only program runs until six. Um, but you know, if it does run until right. three fifty or four, I think that the second bus run would be needed. Um, but would Parks and Rec be able to house this again? We, uh, Kristen, do you, Miss Michael, do you want to uh, address that because you've been in more conversations with. Mr. Schlitt than I have. I, I know that they are short staffed and they're not thinking about doing it again. But I'm not even talking about staff, but more <coughs> just space. So we hadn't talked to them about using the space at the community center to see if that would be available. They have been running programs at our elementary school. They were doing it both at Oak Street and Mount Daniel. Then when they were facing staffing challenges, the need was greater at Mount Daniel. So they only were offering the program at Mount Daniel. Um, they, just like us, have really struggled with hiring staff for one day a week um, for a limited number of hours. Um, but we definitely have not talked to them about doing something back at the community center currently. It just, you know, to me, um, you know, so having a, a child both at Mount Daniel and at Oak Street, um, I just see the difficulties of, you know, especially if there's not a second bus run of, you know, leaving my desk. You know, I, I do have the privilege of working from home. Um, but, you know, leaving my desk at, let's say, you know, 340 to be at Oak Street by 350. Well, no, I'd have to do pick up before 350 because you to, I also have to get to Mount Daniel by 350. So it's, it's about a 45-minute block of time. Having everybody housed at one location just makes logistics easier, I think, for parents because there's only one pickup place. So, you know, during COVID, all the Mount Daniel and Oak Street kids were bused to the Parks and Rec Center, and that just made things easier. Um, I understand the staffing shortages. I also saw it, um, the pay offer was $17.50 an hour, and so I just think that maybe a more competitive hourly um, pay might entice more people to apply for those positions. Um, that's just my two cents on, on that part of it, but um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Silver. Yes, Dr. Anderson. Yeah, I think, you know, I don't, I don't mind talking about the logistics of half day Wednesday, but I do want to get to the uh, parent feedback a little bit more. Um, but I, I, I want to uh, thank Dr. Noonan for uh, kind of broaching the subject with uh, Broody Camps. I think that would be a a great option. I, th I think, you know, the uh, being on the um, uh, daycare advisor, like Leah's on daycare advisory board, I know that, you know, things are kind of packed to the gill gills at uh, both schools. And uh, I think, you know, adding on one more, one more program for the daycare staff might be just a bit too much for them to handle. Um, and I'm not quite sure if Parks and Rec is as motivated as they should be to serve our students, and that's okay. Um, but I think having, you know, someone like Broody or some other vendor uh, kind of come in, partner, partner with us, and you know have that be a real problem to solve. Uh, I think that would be a, a great opportunity to show that you know this is we are providing uh, while we are providing the time for professional development to the teachers, we are also taking the childcare issue uh, that that does burden families with uh, very seriously. So I think uh, I, I think you know pursuing pursuing that option uh, and they. Ha you know, using using community center um, would be I, the, Broody has a has has a good relationship with them, so I think that's something that should be uh, kind of should be uh, uh, explored further. But I think getting back to the um, uh, parent feedback, um, one thing that uh, I think uh, uh, Ms. Downs mentioned uh, earlier is that you know this this is a you know for a lot of people this is a childcare issue, um, and uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the people at the town hall on Sunday, I think, really put it very well when uh, she said that you know, you know, she 
you know, very much like, supported the teachers, wanted them to get their professional development. And that is one thing, one common theme that we've seen is that all, every, even the people who find, you know, even the people who find it uh, inconvenient uh, want to support the teachers. And, uh, and, this is, and that we've come together as a community to do that. Um, and she also mentioned that because we are doing that as a community and putting, that adds a burden to working families, um, to, uh, to those people whose children cannot access uh, the, any, any daycare program, uh, like for example, kids with special needs. So e even if we found childcare solutions for the vast majority of kids who needed just, just that Wednesday, there's still gonna be that impact on those children who cannot access those for various reasons. And I think, you know, what, I don't, that doesn't necessarily need to be an overwhelming factor, but I think those children should be thought about uh, very seriously because that is a one of our more vulnerable populations. And so whether or not we can solve that problem, um, I think that just needs to be acknowledged um, because that is a, a very real problem for parents who work, who also have uh, kids with special needs, and they can't find childcare on those days. And that shouldn't be dismissed by anybody. Um, but she mentioned that this is a community uh, problem to solve. So it's not, we, we shouldn't see it as like, oh, those parents have been able to find out what they need and these parents have been able to find out what they need. We should come together as a community to actually solve the problem for all the parents that this is a problem for. Um, because we are doing, we are providing this benefit uh, to teachers so that they can be more effective teachers. And I think we should take seriously the problem of childcare that this imposes on, on families who, who rely on that. Um, and so I, I, th I thought that was very well put uh, uh, by her. Um, and I think, you know, um, you know, kind of relating to the earlier discussion, that is something that I think we as a board should, uh, should probably push. Uh, and, you know, this is a, uh, you know, this is something that we're, we're allowing teachers the, the time to be effective teachers. But I think because we are doing that, uh, it's the board should also support paying for the child care that we uh, kind of are imposing on, on, the, uh, on the families. Um, and then one small thing uh, that was mentioned at, uh, at, at the town hall, but also in a couple of conversations that I've had at the uh, uh, bus stop that, that I'm at, um, is that a lot of people go into work on Wednesdays. And perhaps uh, Wednesdays is not the best. If, if we want to make it as little of a burden on, on working families as possible, perhaps Wednesdays is not the best day. I'm not, so I, I don't know, how, we, you know I, I hate to do more surveys, um, uh, but being able to ascertain uh, that kind of uh, that kind of information, like when is like a lot of a lot of a lot of companies are going in on Wednesdays. That seems to be a core day for a lot of a lot of private workplaces, a lot of government workplaces. And so, possibly moving it to a Tuesday or a Thursday still allows time for teachers to have uh, that professional development, um, but also does reduce that burden on those people who have to go in on those days. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Any other thoughts, uh, com feedback from parents? Mr. Gold. Yeah, the, the one thing that also came up from parents was the consistency of schedule. Um, and this actually came up also in the school's conversation, but having early release Wednesdays on every Wednesday rather than the Wednesdays that we don't have a full week, or rather than, yes, uh, so just having them every Wednesday. And it was raised in the sense of being able to plan as a parent, but also from child care services. Um, being able to predict for staffing issues. And so that was a question that was raised. Could we go back to that? I think there was more of a push in the last couple of years with the different holidays that were happening throughout the year. And, and we, would we would enforce the not a half day early release Wednesday on a week that had a holiday. Um, and could we go back to just having all Wednesdays? So that was just a question. Um, and then I think, I think just echoing Dr. Anderson's point about um, looking to be creative, but also partnering with our community uh, vendors that might be able to help support this, um, also taking uh, not just the staffing, but I think the liability as well in terms of I know that's a big issue with this whole effort. So I think that's interesting if we try to look for that um, uh, and, and push for that. And then the, the only other thing I think we would add is just the, the concern that was also raised at the last meeting about speaking up for this, because I think there was a question about are, am I allowed to bring up the concern about daycare in an environment where they realize that this is kind of a, you know, a, a big pr uh, professional development benefit for teachers? And can I speak up you know, as a parent or as a community member um, and, and feel safe in that? And so I think we try to address that by saying there's the town halls, there's emails. Um, we're all trying to work on this together, as Dr. Anderson articulated as a community, but definitely we're continuing to stay open until we have the vote. So we encourage people to reach out. 
Yes. I, I just um, thank you um, for all of your feedback. One of the one of the questions that I I guess I am struggling to sort of understand, and maybe you can help me, um, is that this half day Wednesday is a benefit for our teachers as opposed to a necessity to be a, a really high quality instructor for kids. Um, when we eliminated half day Mondays in Fairfax County, we put those professional development days into the calendar as full days of professional development. So this is the way that, this is the process by which we provide professional development. Um, and I don't know, I'm not understanding why um, it's being characterized as a benefit as opposed to um, a necessity to hone uh, one's craft. Mm -hmm. and I, that's the, the, I just, I heard that. Yeah, I, on a we few. had that, re I mean, that term, yes, you're right. That term is used benefit from an HR perspective versus generically a benefit. Um, that term was used by teachers in terms of, especially in terms of retention. Um, they felt like, you know, and we had this told to us, if we got rid of those, then they could go teach in other districts. But this is a benefit that they get to collaborate with their teachers in the manner that they do. Um, I think at the Oak Street discussion, they said very, articulated very well that the concept of professional development on every Wednesday or half day Wednesdays is much more effective to be able to collaborate versus a whole day at the beginning of a quarter or the three you know teacher work days in the beginning of the school year and then you don't hear about it or talk about it until the next year so they felt like that was a benefit for them to be able to collaborate in this manner so i think it's not an hr benefit term um, it's just more of how we've structured as a benefit for more effective learning and collaboration so with the each model other. is the benefit not the the model is it, they feel that the model is more beneficial to them as opposed to um, having a full day, but neither, both are <clears throat> not like benefits from a, I mean, these are, these would be, I guess what, I guess my point is the time that they get to do the professional development would be required regardless of the model, whether it's a half day on Wednesdays or a full day throughout the year. The benefit is that they really like the model that's been selected. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. I think and they were using it like something advantageous, not like benefit like you get insurance, like okay. health insurance. It was beneficial. Like it yeah. was it's not a benefit pay. as in something, yeah. the model was a benefit as it was something advantageous Got for it. them. Right. Got and it. and so, I think also, oh, I'm sorry. No, no. So I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to take into the conversation mm -hmm. and sort of w some of the things that I heard. And I, I guess, I guess the other thing, and I, um, I'm not sure where, and I'm just trying to figure out how, if we do half day Wednesdays or we do full day, full days throughout the year, and, and maybe it's, maybe Ms. Dr. Anderson, it's more in response to the um, comment of we're, we're forcing family, family, we're forcing this on families. I don't, I don't, I'm having a hard time understanding that um, because I don't know that we're forcing it on them. We're, we're providing our teachers with that time whether it's a full day or a half day, it's just the model of how we do professional development. Um, so I'm just trying to, again, yeah, I'm just trying yeah, to Yeah, I'll be, be ha happy to answer that. Um, any kind of schedule that you have for a school is gonna have impacts on how people schedule their lives. And people in Fairfax schedule, the, they have the school schedule and they're able to schedule around that. And it's much easier to do full day childcare as one-offs rather than just, like, like we've said, like it's hard to staff a half day Wednesday program. That means it's hard to find childcare everywhere. Um, and so when I say that we're imposing that burden, it's because we have chosen, it's, it's because we've, we've found and that we think that the burden that we impose is still worth the cost of having that effective teacher, teacher workforce. Uh, and so it is a benefit to the teachers, not just because the teachers have, you know, kind of the time every, uh, more regularly, uh, as, uh, as Ms. Wright at uh, Mount Daniel said, it makes them more effective teachers. And so that is a huge benefit to not only the teachers, but also the students. Um, but I don't think we should uh, sweep under the rug that this does impose a burden on, uh, on people who need to find childcare during that time. That's helpful, thank you. Thank you. It is a complex, as we know, it's a complex topic because it's, you can look at it from so many different perspectives for sure. Any other comments about early release? And, and uh, to Vice Chair Gould's um, point, uh, we are going to, I'm going to work with um, Mr. Brett just to do a couple, um, you know, promos and morning announcements just to remind parents 
that, you know, they, you know, if they didn't feel like that, that they could come to a town hall, may, maybe they, you know, that setting is intimidating or what have you, just remind them that they can always email the school board to offer, um, you know, suggestions. We haven't really gotten, met, we haven't received many emails really, which is surprising. So um, we'll just do a couple, um, you know, we, we are. Wait, we haven't received a lot of emails. For, about early release. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we were seeing a lot of emails. <laughs> well, I mean, it, no, I mean, I think I, th I was envisioning my inbox would be flooded, oh, okay, and I don't okay, okay. about early release Wednesday, and I don't Got think it. that no, that that cool. has unless maybe they're just all emailing you, Tate. <laughs> um, so, which is fun, no. um, but uh, so we'll just remind everyone that they can you know email the school board um, for sure, and I'll just put that out there, and and to remind the public again that the timeline is that um, this is a discussion tonight. And you know we'll we'll look and you know we still have the month of we have two meetings in November, and so we can um, you know we'll see where we are you know if we get any more feedback via email. So we'll discuss this again, um, and we'll I'll try to you know talk call you all individually, see where we are for that first meeting in November, and we don't you know if we feel like we're not ready to make a decision, we can wait till the second meeting in November. So yes, Ms. Silverman. I know some parents have approached me asking um, how they can get in touch with us but not being on the public record. Mm -hmm. So um, just to explain it to the community, mm -hmm. if you write to school board at FCCPS.org, you are on the public record. But if you write to the seven of us just typing it out our emails, which you can, I believe you can find on the website, um, that would not be a part of the public record. I don't think that, Ms. Goodell, that's not right, right? Oh. Uh, sorry, Ms. Sorry, <laughs> well, Please let, correct let me, me then. Let me preface what Ms. Goodell is about to say, and that is that any communications you have are public record, um, just so you know, because they're all foia oh, So if somebody did a FOIA, we'd have to put out all of those. Um, but they're not posted on board docs. Right. right. We, we actually don't post any of them on board docs. Unless. Um, right. So what even, even if it says, please put in the public record, we don't post them on board docs. We did that during COVID. Um, sorry. No, Ms. Goodell, no, you go. No, no please. <laughs> you, no, no, please. No, no, we did, as Dr. Noonan was saying, when we did receive them and they've asked to be particularly for, for public record, instead of posting them as we did in uh, the time of the pandemic when people couldn't come p publicly mm -hmm. to a meeting, we were actually taking them all in, reading them, and then posting them so that everyone could see them. But now that they can attend a public meeting and speak, they have that op opportunity or they can send written and those written that they specifically say I want this as part of the record we are holding them on file in a folder I have at the central office and I tell them that so so if people don't want to be on the public record and, what should they do and they usually will say I do not want this as part of the public record the ones that don't say either way I'm not holding at this point on file okay and obviously, if it's FOIA, that's a different story. But other than that, okay, thank you. Yeah, so I think the schoolboard.org is just more just for ease. Like they don't have to type in all of our, all of our email addresses. But that's fine. I mean, that's yeah, that's that's fine. And I, I think, um, you know, in, in terms of we we want to encourage people to to reach out to us for sure. And um, we, you know. One of the things, I'll, I'll sit down and really um, think about how to put it in more announcements, but also let people know that, you know, we do have the meeting in November where they can come and make public comment. Now that, if they don't want to be on public record, obviously that wouldn't be appealing to them, but that is another opportunity to reach out to us. Yes, uh, Dr. Dimick. The, the school board email goes to more than the school board, though. That's right. That's it, it does go to Dr. Noonan and Mr. Brett. And Marty, Marty and Tricia Minson. And Trish and our attorney. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. We, we prefer that, that that they use that just to kind of keep the lines of communication as right, open as possible. But if they possible. wanted the least number of eyes on their on their email, they could email us. Right. Seven or just one person. Right. Um, Tate Gould. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Get Ms. Tice. Um, just along the lines of the communication for this process, I just wanted to say that how pleased I am with this process. I feel like we. Um, we're really intentional and thorough with our process making the calendar policy last year and we um, felt like we had done a very thorough job I don't want to ever count how many hours we talked about the calendar um, it was a lot but um, 
I think we came out of that thinking that that was a really successful process on building policy. And I feel like we took that lesson and we built upon that even more through this process. And um, it just feels really good when you're making a decision that you know doesn't have an easy answer and that you know is not going to please everybody. That's just the nature of some of these challenges. Um, it feels really good at the end of it to know that we've engaged as many community members as possible and have been as tr transparent as possible and been as communicative as possible um, before we make a hard decision in setting policy. So I just am really proud of the process that we've come up with here and I hope that we're able to replicate that in future um, decisions hard decisions that there'll yeah. be more there yeah. always are no I think that's a great point I mean you know uh, we, since I know Dr. Dimmick and I have been on the school board the longest, we've never done this kind of outreach, literally going to meet with staff and meet with parents. So uh, I, I agree with you. I think that, um, you know, we took, I think we did do a lot of outreach for the calendar, but we didn't take it to this level, which I think, so I, I, I do feel like we've done really our best to really try to get out in the community and hear from people. So, yes, Ms. Silverman. I just wanted to concur and just say, you know, if we are making policy that's going to affect um, all the students, the parents, the community, everybody here, um, that it's really great that we've done all, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't attend all the town hall meetings, but that we were doing the town hall meetings, listening to the community and doing this in the open and in the public and allowing people to comment and give their feedback. Um, I think that's a great, um, you know, way to really engage and, and include everybody's thoughts and ideas. Right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Anderson. Yeah, I think uh, I, I echo um, uh, Ms. Tyson and Silverman's comments. Uh, this has been a thoroughly, I, I, I've found the process thoroughly enjoyable, but also enlightening. Um, but I, I did wanna, I would, I would be remiss, uh, and, and uh, uh, Dr. Newton's comment kind of brought, brought, it, brought my mind back to it, is that when we were at Oak Street and Mount Daniel, I think some of the teachers, when we were talking about it in terms of talking about the early release Wednesday uh, in terms of child care, um, they were kind of of the opinion that some people just saw them as ch child care workers. Uh, and I think, you know, we, I think we tried to reassure them, and I want to do that here, that uh, we don't see them as just child care workers, but I think we also recognize that uh, a school calendar and, and education is intimately tied up in child care, um, and that they, they do a wonderful go job of educating our children and caring for her caring for our children. Um, and so I want to make sure that they, they realize that, um, but also that, again, child care is intimately uh, tied up uh, with education. And I think, you know, and, and I think teachers also realize that because we had some, pe some teachers who couldn't attend the town halls because, of, because they didn't have any child care after, um, after school and they had, to, they had to go do that. And so I think, you know, I think their, their understanding of, uh, of these issues as well. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Can I just say thanks again to all of you? Mm -hmm. we, we've only done this process like you're doing it now once before, and guess what it was for? Mm -hmm. The calendar. <laughs> and it was about moving to pre-Labor Day start, um, mm -hmm. where the, the school board went out in the community, held town hall meetings and the like, and um, these, are, these are big conversations mm -hmm. when you start messing with calendars and time. So appreciate yeah. you all getting out there. Thank you, Dr. Noonan. Uh, so more to come, but this is this is a great conversation. And again, um, to the public, you know, always feel free to email us. And you know, we're looking to make um, a decision sometime in November, either our, our first meeting or, or our second meeting, if necessary. Okay, so we're going to move on now to 4.01 um, FY24 budget amendment, and I'll have Dr. Noonan kick us off. Thank you, Chair Downs. Um, this is coming uh, to you as a budget amendment regarding. Um, the action we're looking for to uh, make modifications to the baseball field at Meridian High School. Um, before you all sort of dive into this topic, there are a couple of things that I, I wanted to um, sort of preface with. The first is uh, just want to thank Kristen Michael and Brian Fowler uh, and their teams for, for working pretty hard and uh, long hours to get answers to the questions that the board has asked. Um, throughout the last couple of weeks to try to get you the best information we can in a timely fashion. Um, to that end, um, I want to thank Brian Fowler for helping me out with a couple of questions that came through today from uh, Dr. Ortiz, and I do have some answers uh, for you, so I thought I'd share those right now just so that everybody has all of the information. Um, one of the questions that Dr. Uh, Ortiz asked is, what is the dimension of the largest rectangular field you can fit in the baseball field when renovated? I understand that the size won't be able to support competition for a number of other sports, 
but just would like to know. And the answer to that question is the largest rectangular field size would be 70 yards by 110 yards, which would accommodate every rectangular sport with the exception of football. So it would be big enough to accommodate soccer, field hockey, uh, lacrosse. Um, trying to think what else is played on a rectangular field. Those are the big ones. Um, so that's, that's thing one. Uh, the second question was, does land, pardon? Field hockey. <coughs> yep, field hockey. Yep. Um, does land tech provide a guarantee against further subsidence um, and for how long? Um, I had to look up what subsidence was for transparency purposes. And that's where the ground starts to slough off. Um, and the answer to that question is they provide a one-year warranty on all their, for their field work. Um, and they would have to do engineering and design as part of this project to ensure that there weren't any issues, that they would abate what would be necessary to make sure that it didn't slough or, um, sorry, um, didn't, subsident, didn't subside. Subside? Is that the right? Subside. subside. Okay. Um, and then the last question is, since we're replacing the field with turf, are there implications uh, for the functioning of the bioretention pond past center field? And that's a really good question because there's also one behind home plate. Um, and the, the news about that is that um, turf is considered an impervious surface. surface um, and as a consequence of that, um, they would need to do some engineering. But we believe that there is good um, there is good infrastructure under the ground that they'd be able to tie into to allow for appropriate drainage into those. So um, just wanted to let you know uh, those, those answers there. But tonight we're asking um, that uh, you approve this budget amendment so that we can um, go ahead and make the appropriate modifications to the baseball field um, and are asking for approval as presented at the last meeting and, and move to this meeting. Thank you, Dr. Noon. So just a brief, um, very high-level summary for those who may not have been following. Um, I believe it was in, and again, I want to thank Ms. Michael. We miss seeing you, Ms. Michael. Hope, hope the weather's good where you are. Um, but thank Ms. Michael and um, Brian Fowler and um, everyone who put so much work into this. We, um, just to give the public kind of a brief overview, and uh, like a slate summer, um, we found out that we are getting going to receive as part of our revenue share with the city close to a million dollars and that along with um, extra year end money allowed us to finally um, look at uh, improving the baseball field and for those who may not be aware it's been a good probably 15 plus years that anything's been done to that field and um, as anyone who's been on the campus recognizes especially after the beautiful building that Dr. Noonan oversaw coming in on time, no, on time and under budget, yes, um, that it's, it's you know, one of those things that, you know, when you improve something in your house, then all of a sudden something else doesn't look so good. So we improved that, and um, we had a new, new softball field, new tennis courts, a new practice turf field. We had hype tunnels now going out to the football field. So basically everything saw love except for the poor – baseball field. So um, this was something that was all, you know, between the revenue share with the city and the year and money, all of a sudden it does seem like, and I know that several on this board have talked about the speediness of this, but it did um, sort of come all together, uh, at, you know, just recently that, oh, we have the money to do this. And um, this is something that, um, you know, parents have advocated for. Um, we've heard from of course, the baseball coaches, but also the coaches of uh, lacrosse and field hockey and soccer, how they could use this as an overflow field, as well as football, uh, that they could use that for the JV football team to practice. We've heard from Parks and Rec and also PE teachers. So the idea of, um, you know, and I think in the beginning we had looked at, you know, just making some modest improvements. And as we talked about it and the money, um, came to us, it, it made sense to look at the turf option because it could become really a community use field, um, both at Meridian and camps could use it. And um, as I said, PE teachers, other varsity sports. So that's um, where we are now. At our last meeting, we talked about this and um, we talked about the subject and um, there were some questions from some board members and um, those questions were funneled to uh, Ms. Michael and Ms. Michael again thank you for the incredible work you did on this getting those answers uh, to our members and that actual document is published is is posted right now on board docs so if anyone wants to take a look it's a 15 page document very thorough document and looking at you know other expenses that um, 
that we had considered in the past and you know we had put money one-time expense money towards instructional um elements and um looking at this now that now it's it's to really look at a, a, a facility cost uh and and so if you look at that document you'll see um you know where where this money is coming from and and um some of the things we talked about also in the document maybe some ways to fund um looking at our concession stand that's the only other piece that sort of um, needs needs some love, and so that's also in that document how we might be able to improve that. So, um, any comments or questions at this point? Yes, Dr. Anderson. Uh, yeah, thank you um, so much, Dr. Noonan, for uh, answering these questions and getting this material to us. We really appreciate it, and um, you know, I, th I think we all realize that the baseball field needed some needs some much 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 needed love and uh and we appreciate the the transparency that this process has been been able to go through um i do want to first like you mentioned uh brian fowler and uh, you mentioned the kind of previous funding that we had given to and i think kathleen uh miss tice uh, would agree uh so we, we were able to visit the baseball field with uh, mr fowler and uh i want to praise him for his uh, fiscal responsibility on how he was uh uh, thinking about using the previous money um, and and coming back and saying, hey, like that would actually just be kind of throwing good money after bad, and we'd have to come back later on. And so I really do want to thank uh, uh, thank his diligence on the issue, um, and and I think that kind of um, leads into my next comment uh, with you know that we threw a hundred thousand dollars at it um, I think last last year um, and found that it was not going to be uh, enough to kind of do what we wanted, and I think you know uh, for kind of thinking about how we want to go through the process of determining what to use kind of the one-time money that kind of just occurs you know on a on a on a kind of a, a, a blessed a blessed fall um, and we realize oh we have some money and we want to be able to use it effectively I, th I think going forward having having that wit like having a true wish list and a uh, a very accurate idea of what those wish list items would cost uh, would be very helpful to the board, um, and it can just kind of be a running running wish list of things that uh, either capital improvements or instructional uh, instructional buys that um, teachers and staff kind of bring uh, bring 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 to you, Dr. Noonan, um, and then having having those uh, those cost estimates so that those ideas are kind of ready to go and just need to be prioritized. Um, and I think you know it would help the board uh, make uh, kind of those decisions as as speedily as possible, but also remaining uh, as transparent as possible. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. And 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 one of the things I think too is, um, you know, I've been I've been I think I've been public about that. Obviously, I have baseball players. So and I've. I'm older than all of you, so I've been around. I've been around the block. So I, for for me, someone like this, this is something that's been talked about in the baseball community for literally 15 years. But, you know, for someone like, you know, some of the board members who are on it, that's to you, I could see why this came out of the blue, you know, that this money has come to us and, oh my gosh, we can finally do the best. So, you know, for the baseball community, it's like, finally. But for, you know, some people on the board, it was like, well, wow. How how are, we, how are we? So I think that's a good idea. Is, you know, I mean, some of that CIP, you know, that some of those. But I think keeping sort of a wish list because the one the one the thing with one time money, you can't really put that towards salaries, but you could put it towards facilities or supplies, and just keeping it sort of an ongoing, just to, you know, so they can keep it on their radar. I think that's a good idea. Any other comments or questions? Yes, Dr. Ortiz. First, I'd like to thank Dr. Noonan and the team for putting together the document that they've posted to board docs. I want to um, uh, direct any community members who are interested in this um, decision to that document. Um, it does a number of things that I think are really important with respect to um, uh, with respect to um, you know fiscal responsibility. It puts the um, it puts the um, investment in the context of both the capital improvement plan um, as well as um, with respect to other one-time funding requests and other school-based funding requests and and, and 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 we have over the course of the only two years that I've been on the board you know you know taken the opportunity with this one-time money to 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 honor some of the, the the funding requests at the school level so I think the document puts a good context around that not just not it, it doesn't necessarily you know 
I'm trying to think of the best way to put it. It doesn't make a value judgment regarding baseball fields or other things, but it notes why this makes sense in terms of a of an investment. Um, and I, and then I think the other piece is I think one of the reasons why I wasn't comfortable moving forward personally with the decision um, a couple weeks ago was that um, the movement from kind of regrading the field, which was kind of the prior the prior. Um, proposal to this um, comes with an, a, a pretty significant cost and then there's a number of different v various improvements that need to be made as well like to the top golf netting and other things like that that I just didn't understand what was coming and going as part of this project and 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 the, the document again that Dr. Noonan and the team have put together goes through that um, one of the other justifications that was put forth which um, I understand, but didn't have a lot of kind of context for was kind of the multi-use piece. Obviously, any flat green surface that's durable can be used kind of all the time for anything. But, you know, practically speaking, from the standpoint of various sports, you know, what did that really mean? And so I really appreciate Dr. Noonan going through that because, you know, now, and this is, I think, to, to reemphasize the community, we have a practice turf field that is, you know, essentially a full-size lacrosse field and probably can handle field hockey, I would imagine. Um, we have, obviously, the stadium field, and then we'll have, essentially, a third full-size practice field. It probably wouldn't be useful for spectators for most sports, um, but that allows for a range of different uses than, you know, the whole complex itself allows for a range of different uses, and so putting that all on paper, I think, is a very, very useful um, thing from the standpoint of justifying the expenditure. So for that reason, I'm, I'm supportive and I look forward to the, seeing the project get done and for it to see it get used for baseball first and then for um, everything else, you know, when they can when they can beg and plead to have the baseball team let them use it. So I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Ortiz. Vice Regal. Yeah, just to echo uh, Dr. Ortiz and Dr. Anderson's points, I appreciate the uh, process, how we did this. I feel like the slowing this down and letting the public get caught up to where we are, not just the baseball community, but also the public in general and also the board members in general, because as uh, Chair Down said, this has been on the, the radar for 15 years, and for us it was just a few weeks. So I appreciate us slowing this down. I think only decisions can only be better by having public input. I think also one of the reasons we slowed this down was to get feedback. I think, Dr. Anderson, you asked this last time about natural versus grass, making sure we give the public time to weigh in on that. Um, and much to the chagrin of, of Mr. Thompson and Mr. Anderson, who are my neighbors, uh, it looks like we're going to be moving forward possibly with a turf. Uh, they are traditionalists. But allowing the public to engage on that conversation um, and weigh in and also get to know the process, I think, is only beneficial if we just take our time, which I'm glad that we did that with this. And I'm, I'm, I appreciate us tabling the vote until this week. I appreciate all the board members on the support on that. So I'm looking forward to moving this forward. Thank you, Vice Chair Gould. Any other comments or suggestion, suggestions? Comments or questions? No? Okay. Well, if uh, someone could, we are at 4.01. Someone could make a motion, please. Yes, Ms. Silverman. I move that the Falls Church City School Board authorize an expenditure and transfer a fund balance of $2 million to the Capital Improvement Fund for baseball field restoration at Meridian High School. Thank you, Ms. Silverman. Could I have a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. DeVink. All those in favor say yes. 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 All those opposed say no. Thank you. Motion carries. And I think this is, you know, for us, I think this is really a something we should as a board be very proud of that we can pull this off because for 15 years we haven't been able to pull it off and so I think you know this is really going to be something that I hope that everyone on this board has a sense of pride when you walk by that beautiful field I'm like getting choked up now so um, but really it, it is true like I think you know just like we have such pride when we see this beautiful Meridian building um, I think this is going to be really something that we can be proud of and I think the seven of us can remember hang our hats on that and be like we did that so Thank you very much. So, okay, we'll move on now to our closed meeting, and that this is actually going to be. Um, we'll, well, I'm assuming we'll end this streaming now because we're going to just come out of close and we'll be adjourning. So, um, for those who are watching, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, we're at 5.01. If someone could read us into close, please, Dr. Dimick. 
Pursuant to the Virginia Freedom of, Freedom of Information Act, I move that the board convene a closed meeting for the following purpose, to discuss or consider the identified subject matter, legal matters under Section 2.2-371188, in particular consultation with legal counsel employed or retained by the public body regarding specific legal, legal matters requiring the provision of legal advice by such counsel. Thank you. Could I have a second? Thank you, Ms. Silverman. All those in favor say yes. Yes. All those opposed say no. Okay. Thank you. We're going to move into closed.